to uh, welcome you to uh, our hearing today. This is the fifth in a series of hearings covering uh, MIA POWs from the Vietnam <coughs> theater. The purpose of this hearing is uh, the continuation of the series investigating the possibility that American servicemen are still uh, missing in Southeast Asia. The purpose of our examination continues to be to provide an opportunity for any individuals to come before this committee to offer information uh, relative to those missing in action. I would hope that this will allow us to continue to develop a, a closer picture in order to obtain a satisfactory and timely resolve. Uh, this, of course, has not been an easy task. Uh, it is a troubling one for those who are survivors of those missing in action. However, since January, we have heard from more than a score of witnesses, each witness imparting to us a personal observation or an opinion, uh, each sincerely attempting to shed some light on this topic. Uh, I remain, as well as uh, my colleagues on the committee, convinced that uh, there is more than a, a reasonable possibility for live Americans to still be held in some capacity against their will in Southeast Asia. However, uh, I think it's a consensus of the committee that uh, we have not reached any final conclusion, uh, despite all the information which has been offered to us at this date. The facts are we still have not been provided indisputable evidence that Americans are being held against their will in Southeast Asia. We feel the evidence must be more than just wishful thinking or speculation. We need hard facts that will satisfy the people who really need to know the truth. And those are the families of those missing in action. We've had a, a change in our um, hearing this morning on the witnesses that are scheduled to testify. First of all, Major Smith stated under oath that evidence that he possessed or so indicated uh, would prove beyond a doubt that there are, or at the very least until recently, Americans still being held against their will in Southeast Asia. Now, Major Smith agreed to provide this evidence within a week of the hearing held in January of this year. We have not heard from him until very recently, and for an extended period of time, uh, we have <clears throat> been dealing through his attorney. I have been told that uh, Major Smith has been traveling in Southeast Asia in an effort to obtain information on American POWs. Uh, I regret that his response has been so long in coming because obviously we're concerned about each passing day and the possibility of Americans remaining alive in captivity grows uh, more difficult uh, with each passing day. At our last hearing, the committee <clears throat> voted unanimously <clears throat> to authorize the issuance, the first issuance of a subpoena to compel the attendance of Major Smith and Sergeant McIntyre and to require the presentation of evidence which they claim to have on POWs. And uh, they, of course, agreed to furnish that information to our committee. Now, the subpoena was not served in order to give both Smith and McIntyre an opportunity to testify voluntarily after communicating through their attorneys. On June 20th, uh, I received a letter from uh, Smith's attorney, which I would like to read into the record at this time. And this letter is dated June 20th, directed to my attention, Senator Frank Murkowski, Chairman of the Veterans Affairs Committee. Dear Senator Murkowski, this is to confirm receipt of your letter of 9 June <clears throat> 1986 which confirms the availability of Major Retired Mark A. Smith to testify before the Senate hearing on Veterans Affairs on June 25, 1986 at 9 a.m. It is also my understanding that the hearing will be held in SD 
562 of the Dirksen Senate Office Building. Although Major Smith has been in Southeast Asia for the past 60 days, I've read the contents of your 9 July 86 letter to him telephonically, and as I expected, Major Smith has agreed to appear at this date, time, and location. On behalf of Major Smith and Sergeant First Class McIntyre and many others who are interested in resolving this problem of Americans missing in action in Southeast Asia, we appreciate your sincere interest and the efforts of your, and the efforts of your staff. Signed sincerely, Mark L. Waple. And it's my understanding that Mr. Waple is an attorney for Mr. S uh, Major Smith. Obviously, I'm, I'm very concerned by Major Smith's uh, disregard of the committee process because Major Smith is not here today. We understand that he was to have been in New York yesterday, maybe in Washington at this time, leaving Washington. Uh, I have instructed the U.S. Marshal to forthwith locate and serve the outstanding subpoena on Major Smith and Sergeant McIntyre, although I understand Sergeant McIntyre is currently out of the country. It appears that Major Smith <clears throat> uh, may have had uh, some difficulty uh, with the information that he claims to have had under oath to possess. His attorney, uh, whom we talked to this morning, stated that the uh, Major was counting on one John Obasi or uh, Robert Grayson to provide all the promised information according to the attorney. And uh, we understand Obasi alleged Grayson has refused to provide anything even to Major Smith. Uh, whether or not Major Smith ever had anything, of course, is something that I would uh, suggest my colleagues address. But indeed, uh, it seems rather unusual that we would have a witness up until uh, a few minutes prior to the, the hearing and then be advised that the witness who allegedly is in Washington is leaving. We understand unofficially that Obasi Grayson is in North Carolina. Allegedly, he uh, uh, allegedly refuses to testify because he claims that uh, the uh, press has been unmercifully misunderstanding misunderstanding of his uh, particular attitude towards this matter. So I would share with my colleagues the uh, current uh, status of our hearing today. And uh, we, uh, I have been given the subpoena notices. And my understanding is that they are being served at this time. I would like to continue, however, for <clears throat> we do have uh, before us today William R. Maples, who is the curator of the physical anthropology at the University of Florida's State Museum. Dr. Maples was retained by the United States Army to evaluate the procedures used by personnel at the Army's Central Identification Laboratory in Hawaii. The Identification Laboratory has a responsibility for identifying the skeletal remains which are reported to be American servicemen returned to the United States by the Vietnamese and uh, Laotian government. Serious concerns have been raised by family members and others regarding certain identifications made by the CIL. The laboratory has alleged to have provided identification of certain remains that cannot be scientifically substantiated, in part because this issue is tied to the POW investigation, but principally because the ethical and moral implications are so acute we are seeking answers to these questions questions which were originally raised when it was discovered that certain identifications were made using bone fragments which under accepted scientific means would not prove positive identification. The charts which we are going to display will help us to understand the extent of the remains which were used to provide positive identifications of the disputed cases. The CIL is capable of remarkable work which we've observed. However, science is still grounded by certain limitations. Did the CIL, in an effort to fulfill the desire to reach closure on all remains, go beyond its scientific ability and identification? Uh, that's a question that we intend to pursue this morning. And of course, Dr. Maples will be able to offer insight in the laboratory's function 
and others. We also have a panel of witnesses representing the Central Identification Laboratory that will respond to Dr. Maple's testimony. I think it's vital that the laboratory operations be of the highest standard in ethics, and I'm sure that those dedicated men and women who work in that facility uh, harbor the same conviction. We need to uh, obviously continue our efforts to bring to a resolve the disposition of the POW MIA issue. I want to apologize to those of you who anticipated, particularly my colleagues on the committee, that we would make a significant step forward by having the testimony of an individual who allegedly had had firsthand information. We will continue to pursue this through the legal process of the subpoena. And undoubtedly, gentlemen, we will have to uh, schedule another hearing to address the uh, disposition of this. Uh, it would be my recommendation that we at least consider the date of uh, July uh, 2nd, uh, depending on the Senate schedule and the House schedule, to uh, make the accommodations, uh, assuming that uh, we're successful in the subpoena process. I would like to uh, now call on uh, the members of the committee for opening statements or any statements they would care to make. Uh, I would call on our senior member, Senator Strom Thurmond. Senator Thurmond. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Chairman, once again, let me commend you for holding these hearings. In order to save time, I just ask unanimous consent that my <coughs> statement follow yours in the record. Without objection, Senator Deacon, senior. Mr. Chairman, let me join uh, President Pro Tem Senator Thurmond in uh, thanking you for a continuation of this. I think it's struggle for all of us uh, to uh, continue to address this with so many ambiguities, and I appreciate uh, your commitment and that of the staff. Mr. Chairman, um, it is indeed unfortunate, and I uh, want to thank you also for taking the leadership in ish signing the subpoenas for Mr. Smith and McIntyre and proceeding with that. I think it's absolutely necessary. You offered a, an excellent suggestion some months ago that we have a round table or uh, square table meeting with all of these people with contradictory uh, positions, General Luer, Moore, Colonel Howard, Colonel Smith, and McIntyre. I thought that was an excellent idea for some reasons, probably scheduled as much as anything else. We were unable to do that, so I think it's absolutely necessary that we do have Major Smith. I'm not anxious to uh, do any damage to Major Smith, but I think we have issues here before us as to the integrity of uh, several generals, as to the integrity of a, a lieutenant colonel uh, in the active service today, and uh, certainly the integrity of Mr. Smith, Mr. McIntyre. Uh, I am uh, aware of the very strong letter that uh, Congressman Hendon sent to the chairman regarding uh, Mr. Abbasi and the uh, committee's alleged exposure of Mr. Obasi, but uh, that was common knowledge by this senator at least. And uh, I regret that uh, <coughs> if there is any inclination on the record that uh, this committee did anything to obstruct the possibility of uh, obtaining information from Mr. Obasi, it was certainly not the intent and the public information was already there and available in the press. However, Addressing what we have today, Mr. Chairman, in lieu thereof, I would ask unanimous consent that the questions that I intend to pose to Mr. Smith be inserted in the record here and now and uh, for the purpose of several. One, uh, so that Mr. Smith can see the tenor of my questions. I won't bore the committee and labor the time of going through them. And that this senator has uh, no desire to put Mr. Smith in any awkward position to expose his military record uh, to make it more difficult for him. I uh, believe, Mr. Smith, when he testified under oath, that he has seen information that in his mind he has concluded that there are living Americans and that in his mind our government may have not done everything that it could, including his superiors. But I think it's important for him to face and address this problem just as it is for us to face and address this problem and come to our own conclusions, and only by asking Mr. Smith these questions and having an opportunity on the record for him to respond to the difference of opinion, professional and otherwise, uh, between his superior officers and himself, will I be uh, satisfied as to what the uh, truth of this 
particular subject matter is. So at this time, Mr. Chairman, I ask unanimous consent that these questions appear in the record at this point prior to the testimony of our uh, witness here. Without objection, uh, Senator DeConcini, uh, so ordered. I'd like to call on my two House colleagues. Uh, uh, while this is a, uh, a Senate Veterans Affairs hearing, these two gentlemen were invaluable to us and accompanied us on our mission to uh, Vietnam, uh, the purpose of which was to address the MIPOW, and they have been with us at each uh, of our Senate hearings. And, uh, uh, gentlemen, your input uh, has been extremely significant. I welcome you this morning, uh, Representative Bill Rockus and Representative McCune. You may proceed in any manner you so wish. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Just very quickly, I want to express again how deeply grateful I am for the generosity that you've extended to us to allow us to part participate in these hearings. Secondly, I want to express my admiration for the diligence with which you have pursued these questions, which are so vital to so many families in, in our country. And whenever we have encountered the type of contradictory testimony that we have experienced during the course of these hearings, your willingness to go into, pri into closed session your willingness to meet uh, privately with the parties involved, your willingness to accommodate in any manner possible the pursuit of the truth in this uh, matter is something that I believe deserves the, uh, the commendation from us all. I, too, sh share the disappointment expressed by uh, the senator from Arizona and others that uh, our, our key witness is not here today. And yet, uh, I believe that this committee has done what is right to bring us to this point, and it is only logical that we can now begin to form some conclusions as to whether or not uh, this information exists and in which direction we go from here. With that, Mr. Chairman, I ask unanimous consent that my uh, statement be, be uh, inserted in the record at this point. I express again my gratitude for your kindness. Thank you, Representative McKeon. Representative Bill Rockus. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, first, sir, I would uh, like to welcome on behalf of myself and his committee uh, Dr. Maples from the uh, from the, my home state of Florida and uh, from my home university as a matter of fact from the university that I and all members of my family attended uh, and I'd like to endorse the uh, comments uh, of my colleagues sir and to also strongly thank you and express my my appreciation for your persistence, perseverance, and caring, and I, and I emphasize that word in wanting to continue these hearings. Uh, I am, like you and the rest of the members, concerned uh, greatly that uh, efforts may have been made to close the books in some cases without factual evidence. Uh, uh, even those most anxious for answers want the truth above all else and nothing less. And uh, I think it's uh, in addition to our our quest to determine were there any live uh, MIA POWs there and, uh, and finding them and getting them back home, we're certainly very much concerned with that area. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I don't know uh, what we can do to convince Major Smith and Sergeant McIntyre and some of those others of our, of our sincere interest in this. Uh, it certainly is not politics. It certainly is not uh, grandstanding on our part. Uh, I, too, was looking forward to seeing Mr. Smith here, and he has let us down. Um, and I certainly welcome uh, any future opportunities to get together with him and, and some of the others. I, too, sir, would have a formal, very short statement that I would ask unanimous consent be inserted in the record. Thank you very much. Thank you uh, very much, Representative Bill Arrakis. Uh, gentlemen, I, I think it important, before we call our witness, to uh, reflect on <coughs> the appropriate action uh, to take beyond uh, the subpoena with regard to uh, our direction. Uh, obviously, uh, we are down to the remaining uh, uh, witnesses. Uh, Senator DeConcini has suggested that uh, we pursue the um, discussion of, uh, of those that uh, are involved in the, the uh, alleged uh, misinformation flow. I would certainly support that, Senator DeConcini. Uh, uh, at uh, an appropriate time, I think it would be probably a priority to continue uh, and uh, hopefully resolve <clears throat> by having the testimony of Major Smith first and at, at that time or after that make a determination of uh, what the uh, next move should be, uh, whether we should try and get all 
the parties together to address uh, their own opinions. Uh, that would be my intention then, subject to uh, individual input. Uh, I would like to proceed uh, additionally with a couple of other items. Uh, <clears throat> I would like to insert in the record communications that I have had with uh, Representative Bill Hendon there. It appears to have been some misunderstanding with regard to the role of the House uh, members. Obviously, this is a Senate uh, committee hearing. Uh, early on, uh, we invited all interested parties that cared to testify to testify. House members indicated an interest in this process. They were again extended an opportunity to testify. The reason that uh, the two members <coughs> are with us on the dais, uh, Representative Bilirakis and Representative McEwen, is obviously they made the trip and I think it was unanimous consent among my Senate colleagues that they be included as part of the hearing process and the hearing function. But it was also decided that other members would be given the opportunity to testify, but not necessarily the opportunity to become a part of the committee. Now, there's been some <coughs> concern over that, so I wanted to make sure that uh, everyone understood that the, we would certainly welcome any testimony that any other member of Congress uh, cared to uh, make to this committee. There is a, a letter uh, between myself and Representative Bill Hendon, the first letter was dated uh, May 6th, and it concerned certain allegations uh, concerning uh, the divulgence of the true identity of one John Obasi during an open session. I would ask unanimous consent that uh, this letter from Mr. Hendon be entered into the record. And uh, my response, dated May 8th, along with uh, a reference uh, as follows, Mr. Gregson's identity was revealed some time ago and an internationally available publication, a copy of which I am attaching, and I'm attaching that copy, which appears in an issue of the Insight Magazine, April 28, 1986. Prior to our hearing, and uh, the reference is made, quote, but the defense official says Obasi is a British con man named Robert Grayson which is known widely to law enforcement officials in Southeast Asia. Gentlemen, I would ask unanimous consent that those letters be a part of the record. Without objection, we will proceed <clears throat> with uh, our hearing. And uh, I have a short statement regarding uh, uh, the remains issue. I think it's important to gain a perspective of what is being referred to when one speaks of human remains. In order to accomplish this, I have obtained enlarged sketches which uh, uh, indicate the extents of the remains to be used to identify those uh, missing in action from an aircraft recently excavated at Poxy, Laos. Now, we're not talking about complete human skeletons, as I understand it. In some cases, the Central Identification Laboratory will have the task of examining over 50,000 fragments of human bones from a single aircraft crash site. As you can see, not all of those fragments can be attributed to any one individual. I make these points specifically for two reasons. First, the task of identification re uh, remains of men who have been missing in some cases over 20 years is a very difficult one. The laboratory must be commended for much of the work it has done over the years. The second point, however, is that in some cases it may be impossible to make positive identification utilizing accepted scientific means regardless of the expertise and capability of the individual and the lab's personnel. The question has been raised time and time again is whether it is acceptable to deviate from science in order to make identifications of our missing men. When answering that question, one must also consider the limitations placed on our ability to obtain the fullest possible accounting of our missing men if we do not incorporate identification methods which have not been accepted by the scientific community. This presents, I think, the dilemma which I hope Dr. Maples will focus on today. I would intend to ask Dr. Maples to use the charts as he sees fit. I don't know whether the lights are adequate, but we will attempt to do uh, the best we can. 
Um, and with that, I would uh, proceed with you, Dr. Maples, and look forward to uh, your statement and addressing the questions that have been brought out in my introductory remarks concerning your extraordinary area of expertise and responsibility. Please proceed. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, first of all, I must apologize. I just told a few moments ago that I'd make an opening statement, so I don't have one prepared, but here we go. The, uh, the three of us, Dr. Ellis Curley chairing the, the committee, myself, and Dr. Lowell Levine, a, a forensic uh, dentist, were asked by the Army to go to the uh, SEAL High, the Central Identification. Well, you just pull the microphones a little closer, please. Certainly, sir. To go to SEAL High, the Central Identification Laboratory in Hawaii, uh, and evaluate its procedures, its staff, and so forth. Uh, a number of uh, inquiries have been made to most of us already on the, that committee from other sources that uh, perhaps problems existed there, particularly in relation to one incident, the crash at Poxe and the identification of those remains. We went and our three independent reports written after consultation with one another uh, were very similar in findings. And those findings basically were that the, uh, we were given every opportunity by the Army while we were there in a very limited time that we were given to uh, make any inquiries uh, of any unclassified information and all of our inquiries were met openly and with maximum cooperation. Uh, I still am uh, very impressed with the cooperation uh, that we received while we were at the laboratory. Uh, the staff of the laboratory is without doubt extremely dedicated to the mission of the, the lab, and that is to, to uh, identify the remains of military personnel, uh, identify them correctly, and to uh, uh, do so in a dignified and proper manner. The incident of Poxe seems to be quite different in its uh, overall nature from everything else that goes through the laboratory. First of all, Poxe was indeed a, an unusual situation in the amount of destruction of the skeletal remains. The aircraft concerned was a gunship that uh, was apparently hit in uh, midair, uh, exploded into a fireball. Two individuals uh, were uh, rescued after parachuting after the plane was hit. Uh, this occurred at night and uh, was uh, it's, doctor roughly on it's in Laos, and I'm not a geographer. I only have the, the roughest uh, sketches. Uh, I, I can't even see the map from behind. Well, if you can't see it, it, that means that those of us behind aren't going to be uh, able to see it. It's in uh, central Laos, uh, just in from the label of Vietnam into Laos. Okay. Uh, just not sure where to point. <laughs> I'm sure the uh, uh, witnesses following me who actually participated in the excavations there will be able to show you much better than I no, anyway, that's fine. where the, the excavations took place. Uh, all of us, or many of us in forensic anthropology, deal with massively destroyed human remains. In one case that I'm uh, working on now in my home county in Florida, we have two individuals who burned in a shack after apparently a murder-suicide. And the, the conservative estimate of those remains is that we have at least 10,000 fragments. Uh, now, those, both of those individuals, I'm now confident, will ultimately be positively identified. But I've been working on those two sets of remains now for a year and a half, and I have excellent documentation on, most, on both individuals in terms of x-rays uh, taken during their lifetimes, uh, good dental records, and so forth. In the case of the military personnel in Poxe, uh, military records were adequate uh, for identification, but the, the, the remains were just totally destroyed virtually. All three members of the committee looking at the documentation, and documentation alone that exists in the lab during our visit, agreed that two of the individuals could have been positively identified from dental evidence. 
This is two out of 13, or actually 14 individuals. Uh, the rest of the material was basically unidentifiable. There's no technique uh, known to science uh, or even suggested to science that could have identified the remainder of those individuals. It's possible one or two could be with additional work by uh, gluing fragments of teeth together and so forth, but uh, as the evidence has been presented in the documentation at Seal High, they are unidentifiable. We pointed out in our report uh, to the Army, all three of us, I believe, independently pointed out that the material was unidentifiable in the majority of individuals and that we couldn't prove a mistake was made because you can't say that a mistake has been made when it's something is unidentifiable. Uh, and several times lately I've heard uh, a, a statement that, well, the committee says no mistakes were made. If you have a, an unidentifiable fragment of bone, I can't prove that it's been attributed to the wrong individual. How many individuals were present on that plane? I said that 16 were on the plane when it was hit, two were rescued. A part of a body of a, another individual was blown out at the time of the explosion. Uh, an arm was found. It was identified by fingerprints in the days after the incident. And so that man was accounted for at that time, leaving 13 unaccounted for individuals. During the excavations at Poxe, the team recovered uh, these 50,000 fragments, and they recovered, I believe, six identification tags and one partially burned uh, membership card in a uh, uh, base uh, club of some sort. Some of those one of those tags belonged to the man whose body was partially blown out of the aircraft and had been accounted for. Uh, so really, there were probably the remains of 14 individuals at least partially represented on the aircraft. All 13 unaccounted for men were positively identified from these few fragments. Looking at the documented uh, charts from the laboratory, and using an established procedure that, that we use in any situation like this of counting the minimum number of individuals that could have been there by the duplication of identi identifiable fragments or teeth, I find that we can positively say at least four individuals were present, possibly five. Now, if I had all of the, the skeletal remains and all of the dental remains to work with, I. I might be able to push that number up a few. But there is no way from the, the information that we have, the lack of right and left duplication of fragments and so forth, that you can positively say that there were definitely 13 men aboard that plane when it crashed, or 14, as the case really is. Uh, so that's, that's the situation as it stands in, in my view. Uh, why this took place, I don't know. Looking at the, the printed reports coming from the laboratory, uh, several of us have found some misleading uh, statements in them. For instance, in the case of uh, one of the uh, airmen aboard the aircraft, uh, a fragment was identified as a pubic bone. Uh, now, this portion of the, the front of the pelvis here is the pubis. And it is a rel relatively small bone, but obviously it does have several different aspects to it. Now, if this part of the pubic bone were found, it isn't identifiable in terms of age or anything like that, unless it were a very young, immature individual in all of the personnel that we're talking about aboard this aircraft, you couldn't use that to establish any even rough idea of age. And yet in the, the report, it says that the, uh, that a portion of the left pubic symphysis, most accurate method of, of aging was found. Now that's this portion of the bone. It is very useful in 
the age range of the military personnel aboard that aircraft for a rather precise estimate of age. But many anthropologists now have looked at that set of remains. I've compared that set of remains to photographs taken at the laboratory to make sure that nothing has been changed during the intervening time. And the fragment identified as pubic bone may in fact be a pubic bone, there's some doubt about that even, but all of us without any reservations at all agree that it is not a pubic symphysis. No one with even basic competence in forensic anthropology and human osteology can mistake a pubic bone fragment for the pubic symphysis and establish any sort of age estimate from it when it's not there. It is very characteristically thin. The, the bone on the, over the spongy part of the bone is paper thin, and the fragment in question does not show any of these characteristics. It does not show any characteristics of a pubic symphysis. Now this is an example of something that's misleading. Several sets of remains now have been looked at uh, at the request of the families concerned by a number of anthropologists. And all anthropologists who've looked at those uh, have agreed that they're unidentifiable and all are quite concerned with comparing those remains with the reports co coming out of Seal High. Uh, what, could, what could be done to, to correct this problem, to make sure this doesn't happen again? Uh, well, first of all, the location in Hawaii is rather isolated, and the scientific personnel uh, are not able to participate in uh, interaction with their professional colleagues often enough uh, being in Hawaii. Also, the personnel being identified by the laboratory are indeed uh, far more than Army personnel. In this case, all of them are Air Force personnel. It would make much more sense to have this identification lab, a tri-services laboratory, uh, and located at some uh, already existing facility, such as the Armed Forces Institute of Pathology out on the Walter Reed grounds. Uh, and uh, with that sort of thing, I believe that any problem would, would uh, clear up. I'm not going to, to belabor the point that the, the laboratory is, has done a poor job. I think the laboratory on the whole does a good job. Uh, deservedly or undeservedly, the credibility of the laboratory and its personnel has been questioned. And I think that something should be done to uh, reestablish uh, re this credibility with the families uh, of these missing personnel. And I'm quite concerned that uh, uh, Military remains are identified on the, the basis of virtually non-existing evidence to account for missing individuals. Thank you, sir. Dr. Maple, I, I wonder if these charts, uh, from the standpoint of communicating to us the identification process, uh, would, would be helpful in, uh, in making reference to uh, what I assume as a layman would be a, an identification for, say, positive from dental records vis-a-vis -vis, uh, your, your contention that indeed that may be insufficient. Uh, you, you, and you, uh, you mentioned the pelvic uh, uh, bone and the part of it that was instrumental in determining age and the part that wasn't. You're free to come up if you feel this would be helpful to you. Thank you, sir. Uh as a, a professor, I'm always uh, a little bit more at ease on my feet and in front of charts. Uh, this is the, uh, I point out that these are the charts uh, that you see here of uh, only seven of the, the individuals. The others, I believe, are probably under these. But I think they are uh, representative of what we're dealing with here. Uh, this is the uh, chart uh, for the the case that I was just talking about, on these charts that you see, what was found has been blackened in. The rest of the skeleton that is blank uh, is material that was not found. 
So in all of these, we only have these black or reddened areas of the skeleton. In this example, for instance, this individual was represented only by teeth, while this individual had no teeth present, a few bone fragments from the skull, and a few from various other bones. This is the, the pubic bone, and you can see in the area that has been blackened in that it's the part of the pubic bone that is the pubic symphysis. Well, I can guarantee uh, without any doubt at all that this is not an identifiable part of pubic symphysis that was found. The height of this individual was established as being over six feet tall. Now, stature is determined on the basis of measurement of individual long bones from the arms and preferably from the legs and using formulae to calculate the height during one's lifetime from those long bone lengths. To get a long bone length, you need more or less all of the bone. If you have a complete bone, the best estimate that you can say is, well, for instance, if you had the femur and the tibia for a white male in perfect intact condition, and you added those two measurements together and used the formula, you could come out with an estimate of height plus or minus a standard deviation of 1.1 inches. Now, if you take 1.1 inches in either direction of this standard estimate, you come out with a plus or um, uh, a range of over two inches, two and a quarter inches roughly. Uh, if what you're saying is that 66% per, of all individuals with bones from the leg of that length would fall in that range. But that means you still have a third of the population that wouldn't. So you have to add another plus or minus 1.18 inches. So now you have an estimate of a, a range of over four inches, four and a half inches of a possible estimate. Now that's not very precise. If you took the the all of the 13 men missing board that, both of the bones and complete, this, and yes, complete, complete. Un, un, uh, obliterated here you only had one no sir you have none you have none you have fragments fragments only, only of one that cannot be used uh, mm -hmm. to estimate the the length Thank now you. a technique called morphological approximation has been suggested as the basis of this uh, morphological approximation is to take a fragment and compare it with a, a, a collection of bones to find the bone that looks like it's the same size as that. Then you measure that bone. You have a, a large fragment, you compare it, you find a bone with that, those characteristics and that size on that bone, that's the one you measure. But that means that your estimate is not even going to be as precise as it would have been Otherwise, I gave you the best possible scenario. Two complete. Me, Doctor, yes, sir. Are you suggesting that, 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 that the the technique of the camera overlay in the prison, which is what you're addressing, is no, not sir. No, scientifically? No, sir. I, I beg your pardon. That. Uh, well, we're, the superimposition technique is something that's different. Uh, the morphological approximation technique is uh, uh, one uh, that we're talking about here, and that is one that was used in this series of poxa to establish. Uh, uh, stature, the, uh, the technique of superimposition using fragments, uh, the overlay technique, is to compare with photographs of the missing person to see whether or not the fragments could have come from the skull. My that, question though, is that scientifically accepted, that process? It can be if you have a complete skull uh, and a good photograph it can certainly eliminate individuals by saying no, they couldn't possibly come from the same face. If they match wonderfully, it might suggest uh, that they could have been from the same individual and then with some sort of other supporting information it might be useful. But where you have isolated fragments from a skull, it is Thank totally you. useless. Uh, Doctor, can I ask a question on Senator this? Senator Deaconson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, morphological approximation. Uh, this is or is not an accepted forensic anthropologic te technology for positive identification, is it? 
It is, has been used by most of us at one time or another to get a rough idea of the size of the individual we're dealing with. But a rough idea can't be used to sort through 13 individuals on a plane who are uh, in normal it, size range. Is it safe to say that it's not accepted for positive identification? Under those circumstances, no, sir, it wouldn't be. And do you think that it ever will be accepted by the forensic anthropology community as po for positive identification? No, sir, it will not as a means of positive identification. It cannot. Thank you. Dr. Ben, is it, is it true to say that you use a composite, what you can find, plus uh, additional substantiation, uh, which may be a dog tags, personal effects uh, adjacent to, and uh, draw the best conclusion? And then do you give a qualification uh, on your identification, or is it uh, just we believe to the best of our well, examination that this is probably Every case is unfortunately different there. If you're dealing with uh, a body burned in a, a car and the man was heavily insured, you probably would be suspicious of, of the identification until you could case, prove sir. beyond a doubt that indeed that was the, pers the person you're dealing with. On the other hand, if you're in a military situation and you have two <coughs> crew members manifested on that particular aircraft and you find two, crew, two different individuals the remains of positively two individuals on that burned out plane, uh, even the barest uh, confirmation of, of identification would be reasonable for a positive identification under those circumstances. It couldn't be anyone else virtually. And if it fits at all, then, then it's a good identification. If you have 13 individuals on one plane, then, then it becomes much more difficult. If you had positively 13 sets of remains, then some technique like morphological approximation may be useful in sorting the individuals. But in terms of proving that those 13 people are all there and all dead, it's useless. Now, one of the, the problems in, in the case of military remains is that up to a point, we must accept what's coming with the remains from Southeast Asia concerning where they were located and so forth. Uh, up, up to this point, I think that the uh, laboratory is doing an excellent job in catching any mistakes being made in Vietnam. One of the advantages that we have is the total lack of training in the Vietnamese. They don't know what we do in terms of identification, so therefore they can't play games with us. Uh, one of my fears is that we educate them to our identification process, and if we educate them to our identification process, then they would be capable of doing uh, much more elaborate uh, things in terms of confusing and uh, making this entire issue much more complicated. Uh, when I'm not at these hearings, I'm involved with it uh, daily, and uh, I appreciate very much your efforts and the interest of Senator DeConcini, the gentleman from the House who have come over, and I thank you for permitting me the opportunity to say that. Thank you very much, Senator Denton. I, I do want you to uh, be aware that we had planned to have uh, That's correct. We had planned, uh, obviously, to have Major Smith uh, yes, no, with us this morning. Unfortunately, um, uh, he, uh, for reasons that are not entirely clear, has made the uh, determination that uh, he either doesn't have the evidence that he alleged to have had or is unwilling to appear. We have, uh, I've just been notified that we have a police officer uh, go in question, and then I'm going to call briefly on. on Senator Denton for well, I just statements. wanted to say I, I'm chairing a security and terrorism uh, hearing this morning, and that's the only thing that will require me to leave. I just want to compliment you, sir, for 
pursuing this subject, which is of such uh, interest to our nation and to the families and friends of those involved. And I am following this with staff and uh, when I'm not at these hearings, I'm involved with it uh, daily. And uh, I appreciate very much your efforts and the interest of Senator DeConcini, the gentleman from the House who have come over. And I thank you for permitting me the opportunity to say that. Thank you very much, Senator Denton. I, I do want you to uh, be aware that we had planned to have uh, That's correct. We had planned, uh, obviously, to have Major Smith uh, yes, no, with us this morning. Unfortunately, um, uh, he, uh, for reasons that are not entirely clear, has made the uh, determination that he either doesn't have the evidence that he alleged to have had or is unwilling to appear. We have, uh, I've just been notified that we have a police officer uh, going out to National Airport to serve the subpoena, assuming we are able to do so today. We may still have him appear, but that's obviously an unknown. Uh, I intend to uh, address the issue uh, a little later with counsel on the appropriateness of calling uh, Obasi alleged uh, Gregson before the committee. He is not a United States citizen. Uh, I understand he is a British subject, so uh, we're going to need to, to do a little uh, research on whether or not uh, and under what procedure he might appear before the committee. I would ask uh, the members to uh, reflect on on the uh, merits of, uh, of bringing this gentleman in. He has played a, a major role, at least uh, as far as the information or misinformation as the case may be, with regard to the alleged uh, film in the alleged Americans that are alleged to be held in some capacity in theoretically a gold mine, I believe, in Southeast Asia. So uh, I think it would be uh, appropriate to uh, try and address a little more of uh, just what he might bring in the way of uh, information. It's my understanding he was recently released from prison in Singapore after serving uh, some time on some various charges uh, which uh, are a little difficult to determine. But I think the point, uh, Senator Denton and my colleagues, is that we continue to attempt to follow up each lead with uh, the diligence and patience so that the record can practically reflect on the, the reality that this is intended to be an open forum to bring information, factual information, to address the issue of the MIA POW because uh, indeed there has been much misinformation and it's hopeful that uh, this hearing will contribute uh, something to a, a final uh, resolve, at least to the best of our ability and to our satisfaction on the issue. Uh, I would uh, defer to my colleague, uh, Senator Deacon C. I do have some questions for the witness. Please, Mr. Proceed. Chairman, I'm more than happy to wait. No, go ahead. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Dr. Maples, I do have some, some questions, and uh, thank you for explaining morphological, uh, morphologic uh, approximation to me. Uh, there is some indication that the CIL reports were altered by administrative personnel to make them more readable by non-anthropologists. During your investigation, did you and the other members of your review team find that this was in fact being done? And if so, did these rewritten reports lessen the technical justification and uh, explanation of the findings? I can't answer that question directly, sir, because uh, uh, we were there such a brief time, but uh, I've been told that any reports that were changed were changed uh, within the lab when they were sent back to the lab for additional details, and then additional things were added by the scientific personnel in the laboratory or by uh, perhaps non-scientific personnel attached to the laboratory who uh, uh, were uh, in communication with who, the scientific personnel. Who told you that, uh, Doctor? Uh, Miss Maloney uh, uh, told me and told several other people independently the, the, this. That's when you were there? Uh, no, sir. This uh, took place in February. So you actually never saw any uh, appearance of altered uh, administrative uh, records? Uh, no, sir. There, I saw nothing of that sort. Uh, even though the CIL 
employs a non-PhD GS-13 with 35 years experience who oversees uh, three PhD forensic anthropologists. Do you believe such a senior forensic anthropologist should be permanently located at the CIL? I think that a senior forensic anthropologist should be located at CIL, but I don't think it should be and that, that person. That is one of your recommendations that you made, is it not? It is. It was a recommendation made by all three of us that uh, the, the existing personnel at the lab have uh, additional supervision brought in over them. Uh, in reviewing those recommendations that uh, your, your committee made, uh, were they unanimous on these? Uh, I don't have them numbered, but there are several pages, three pages of them here, of the so-called review team recommendations. Uh, they weren't unanimous in terms of wording. Uh, some of us were uh, more uh, uh, descriptive than, than others. But in terms of the recommendations, the recommendations generally were, were identical. And then I, I notice, uh, just out of uh, observation, that uh, the initial U.S. Army evaluation was that they concur in uh, every recommendation. Do you have any idea if they have fulfilled their concurrence? Uh, have, have they complied, rather, with the concurrence? Or do no, you know? sir. No, sir. I feel very strongly that they have not. Uh, there has been talk of one anthropologist occasionally uh, uh, visiting the lab and uh, working in that capacity to supervise by uh, visiting from, from uh, this area. But uh, that, that just couldn't do it. If they had, uh, among the, the existing scientific personnel in the lab, they probably, uh, with uh, a little additional training and, and encouragement, probably some of the PhDs there could take over the uh, supervision of the lab. If they had more than one individual, so you have a little bit of a mixed uh, uh, viewpoint coming into the lab, it might work. Another problem is the next step up from the lab, the ASGRO Review Board, uh, uh, is composed of uh, three marticians, I believe, and a uh, uh, quartermaster officer. And that, that panel probably isn't adequately uh, composed to understand whether the reports coming out of the lab are good ones or not. And we, we really need experts on that board, uh, and if we had experts on that board, then the laboratory itself would, I think, fall in line. Uh, was that one of your recommendations as well? Yes, sir. It was a recommendation of all of us. Thank you. Uh, in the specific case that you went to here, chart number three, um, is that uh, the chart of Lieutenant Colonel Hart? Do you know? Uh, no, sir. The, the number three was uh, Chief Master Sergeant Fuller. Do you know which one was Lieutenant Colonel Hart there? Yes, sir. Uh, Colonel Hart is the one on the uh, far end. Far, far right. There. Yes, sir. The one with the upper bone in the right arm marked and the uh, neck of the left thigh bone marked. Now, my understanding, and I'll ask uh, the Army personnel when they get up here, that uh, morphologic approximation was used in that positive identification. Is that your understanding? Yes, sir, it was. And I have now seen the remains of uh, attributed to Colonel Hart. They were sent uh, to my laboratory. Uh, and uh, I did analyze them. Uh, they, I could not prove that they came from a single individual. I couldn't prove that th those remains were those of Colonel Hart. Uh, the particular bone in question, the humerus, I compared with bones in my skeletal collection at the laboratory and found bones of uh, more than two centimeters in length difference that, that closely compared to that particular bone. So you have a, a central estimate of about uh, two or three inches in the height of the individual concern. And then when you apply the standard deviation to take in population variation, it's worthless. So your testimony is that there is no convincing scientific or circumstantial evidence to make a positive identification? No, sir. Uh, if I may, uh, the... Uh, uh, the remains that I have in my hand have been sent. Uh, these are the remains of uh, attributed to Sergeant Fuller, the ones that I was showing you on the chart. Mm -hmm. And these are the total remains of Sergeant Fuller. Uh, and this is the so-called fragment of pubic bone uh, in question. 
and the, the thickness of the bone over that area that, that vaguely resembles the pubic symphysis is several times the thickness that bone would be on the pubic symphysis. No one could really mistake that for a pubic symphysis, and at the same time, if you mistake it, mistook it for a, a pubic symphysis, there's no way that you could get any aging information from it. Is, is that uh, the remains that you have? Uh, the same question, is, is there convincing scientific or circumstantial evidence from what you have that that identifies chart number three, starting from the left, going right? No, sir, there is no way that you could tell that these were the remains of Sergeant Fuller, that these were the remains of any particular one individual. Some are burned, some aren't. Uh, in the reports, the, the reports say that the remains were sorted by texture, by burning, and by location in the, the excavation. Uh, some of these remains come from quite different places at the excavation, and they're attributed to one individual. In this case, we have a burned bone, and we have unburned bones. Uh, Texture-wise, there's remarkable difference in these uh, bones. Uh, there, there seems to be a lot of window dressing in these reports and little substance. Uh, doctor, during your review of the CIL, were, were you able to determine why in your professional judgment or your personal judgment of just ob observing without the uh, professional background, the lab would use unproven scientific methods to determine the identity of these remains. Well, the, the techniques were unproven, uh, and in that I, I, I wouldn't be critical to, to use something that's new and unproven to see whether it substantiates other things, I think is a reasonable first step, mm -hmm. or a reasonable step along the identification process. Your uh, quarrel, if any, then, I don't want to put words in your mouth, I'm sure you won't let me, your quarrel, if any, is coming to the conclusion of a positive identification uh, yes, sir. with this evidence. Nothing wrong in doing what they did except their conclusion? Well, the, the amount of variation that they allowed in their, their estimates was totally inadequate, and uh, 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 even someone in introductory courses in human osteology would not be allowed to write a report inferring such accuracy uh, uh, from this type of evidence. Do you know, my last question, Mr. Chairman, do you know if uh, your colleagues in your review panel, did they uh, uh, concur or have an opportunity to review any of these remains? Uh, and come to the as same As far as I'm, I know, I'm the only uh, individual who has seen, on the review panel, who has seen the heart remains. Uh, Dr. Curley, I believe, reviewed the files and basically, uh, and I don't want to put words in his mouth, but he told me that he, he basically shared my, my conclusion that the remains were unidentifiable. Uh, now, you mean from, uh, without uh, putting words in his mouth, but just for the record, you mean that uh, the doctor looked at the records based on what were in the records, not the specimens. That's correct. He sir. could not come to a conclusion. That's correct. And uh, that there was positive identification, and in fact, your observations or conclusions he would generally support. Yes, sir. And uh, I uh, understand, in fact, I just got the information. I don't know the, the source of the information, but uh, uh, the uh, ASGRO board has rescinded the identification on Colonel Hart. Uh, based on uh, presumably my report and, and Dr. Curley's you know report. if they've rescinded any other positive identification? No, sir, today? that's the only information that I, I have at this time. Well, Doctor, I want to thank you for taking the time and, and uh, being part of this because these kind of problems uh, uh, may be overzealousness or, 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 or not enough expertise on the part of the CIL, and uh, it's not my purpose to be critical, but it is my purpose to try to make a record that we need to do absolutely everything scientifically and not hedge because of the emotional involvement of this type of identification and the misleading effects of it and uh, your willingness to step forward in what I consider a very uh, professional manner, uh, not uh, interested in pulling down or discrediting anyone, is greatly appreciated by this senator. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much, uh, Senator Deaconsini. I certainly agree with your uh, analysis and summary. 
I think the question, Doctor, is uh, if we can't uh, prove scientifically uh, the identification, then the, the question comes up, is it possible that the uh, they may still be alive, those are missing. In other words, we can't positively identify, so the hope springs that indeed there may be a possibility even remote. My question to you is, as a consequence of a combination of factors, A, the fact that you can't make a positive identification, but you uh, accumulate as much material as you can and uh, make a qualified identification or, in each case, a specific evaluation. Uh, what is your general uh, conclusion in the sense of the other alternative, the likelihood of, uh, of some of those that are not positively identified still being alive? Based on the skeletal evidence, uh, I think the possibility uh, must be quite high that uh, several individuals from Pox A could be alive based on the, the information concerning the circumstances of the crash, and of course I'm only, uh, uh, I only have unclassified information available to me here, uh, the possibility does exist that several other individuals may have gotten out of that aircraft before it hit the ground. Well, I'd like to go over that with you because as, uh, as, as you've indicated, the, I believe the epoxy uh, crash, uh, was there, there were two that survived that, uh, were there 16 aboard or 15? There were 16 aboard, and uh, two, two, two survived. survived. One man's arm was blown out by the explosion and was recovered uh, immediately thereafter and was identified by fingerprints. So he was accounted for. That was, leaving, thir that was the 13th then. That was the 14th, the 14th, leaving 13 unidentified and unaccounted for. And your assessment of the remains of those 13 all bears a qualification uh, in the sense of your inability to positively we, identify, we have but tags, you have... We have tags of uh, five of uh, those individuals and six, if you count a, a membership card, in, including uh, the, uh, uh, the seventh one with the, whose arm is blown out. We have his tag also from the crash. Uh, I think the to be perfectly uh, brutal in the, my analysis, I would think the likelihood is quite high that all of those individuals were aboard the aircraft when it crashed, uh, if their tags were, although all of us are aware of circumstances where, where people take tags off in an aircraft and, and other circumstances. Uh, but uh, uh, the people who, one of the people whose ID tag was not recovered was positively identified by teeth. So he's one of those identifiable ones. But that still leaves uh, four or five individuals who could be alive even if you write off the others on the basis of tags. Uh, it's my understanding that five parachutes were recovered at the crash site after the crash. Now, parachutes may be deployed uh, during a crash without anyone actually getting out of the plane parachutes were found, and it's also my understanding, uh, and this has been not, now national television, uh, that a, uh, the initials of Colonel Hart were seen in the area uh, shortly after the crash as well. The circumstances surrounding the, the two that survived, uh, I assume that they, they were able to successfully parachute out of the aircraft? Yes, sir. And they the explanation some... for the other, uh, the other three is? Unknown. Unknown, sir. Uh, they had some warning. The, the, uh, the plane was flying at low altitude, low speed. It took a hit. Uh, apparently there was uh, fire aboard and they had some opportunity of getting out. Then there was an explosion and the plane in a fireball went into the ground. It impacted so hard in the ground that bone fragments were recovered during the excavation 10 feet underground. Uh, all of the 20 millimeter automatic cannon ammo on the uh, plane, which was considerable, then went off after the crash and it burned and exploded and so forth. So it was uh, amazing destruction. Well, I guess my question still in your testimony is the reference to a, a positive identification, at least to dental records, uh, as opposed to 
a number of other identifications that you indicate are not positive but are, I guess, uh, circumstantial. Based on the material recovered, ID tags, bones, and teeth, uh, there is considerable possibility that other individuals uh, survived that air crash. And in your evaluation or uh, examination of the final uh, account of the uh, crash, what uh, explanation was given uh, by those that would observe the self-evident uh, conclusion that you've come to that there are others that could have survived the crash yet are unaccounted for? Was there any reference in your recollection to uh, no, sir. Uh, none to my recollection. Uh, in reviewing all the documents uh, available to me at the laboratory, I found no attempt at all to do what all anthropologists would do in a situation like this, find out the minimum number of individuals represented. There was no chart prepared uh, counting left bone, right bone, this, this fragment, that fragment, this tooth, that tooth. Nothing was done. Uh, and uh, they were all sorted into individuals right at the very beginning, apparently. Okay. Was there any explanation given as to why that wasn't done? No, sir. Did you ask? Uh, I asked, uh, uh, and Mr. Frewey said, just smiled and said no. Just no. I would direct uh, our staff to initiate a communique requesting an explanation of uh, why that procedure was not initiated. I would also ask that we include in the record uh, the, uh, the final uh, examination and Air Force uh, review of that accident with the detailed explanation, if there is one, as to the uh, accountability mm -hmm. of those who allegedly may have survived. In other words, the question of A5 parachutes two survivors, uh, the individual who had positive identification through his arm. My purpose is not to uh, necessarily uh, relive the event, but to provide for those that want to examine this record a reference to some appropriate questions which you, Doctor, have, have raised that uh, I think deserve the uh, inclusion in the record of uh, that portion, and it may be uh, within the uh, interest of our committee to pursue that with others even further. But uh, I, I, I'm wondering, uh, just a couple of brief questions, Doctor. The identification of Colonel Thomas Hart, uh, which you may be familiar with, is that correct? Yes, sir. Appeared to have been made primarily through the use of the morphologically uh, approximation based on Mr. Fuhrer's, or is it Fioroli, determination that the remains identified as those of Lieutenant Colonel Hart indicated that the individual was slightly above average in stature, muscular appearance, and after having examined the remains identified as allegedly Colonel Hart, do you agree that they indicated uh, this type of muscular development above average? Uh, they were average, well-built individual, but uh, uh, nothing out of the ordinary. Well, I, 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 in, uh, all right, there's last month I, I had several individuals identified in my laboratory with, with that type. What of I was involved. leading up to was whether you could make an assumption of whether indeed uh, that was one of the remains of that accident. No, sir. Uh, I think uh, those remains could not be identified with any, any degree of probability as those of Hart or, in fact, that you could say all of those fragments came from a single individual. Uh, I'm wondering if you would comment on uh, uh, the uh, reference to Dr. Ellis Curley as the forensic anthropologist responsible for reviewing the recommendations of the, of the CIL. Uh, have you had a chance to review his qualifications? Uh, well, I know Dr. Curley, I've known Dr. Curley for many years, and uh, I consider his uh, expertise and his ethics to be absolutely impeccable. Thank you. Representative Bilirakis. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Dr. Maples uh, 
you refer to the the tragedy that took place in Florida some time ago, 10,000, resulted in 10,000, did you say 10,000 bone fragments? And you've been working on that for one and a half years and still have not been able to make positive identification, knowing that having all the background of the members of the family available and whatnot, is that right? Yes, sir. One of the individuals concerned is an ex-con uh, convict who uh, has uh, managed to uh, accumulate 10 aliases over his lifetime, and that's made things a little more difficult in that particular uh, thing. But, uh, and I have uh, uh, essentially a staff of two part-time students and myself working on all of my cases, uh, considerably less than, than at Seal High. Uh, but my laboratory, I think, is better equipped than Seal High. Doctor, uh, in referring to the uh, the excavation, uh, you said that two out of the 14 could have been positively identified through dental records. Does that mean that the other 12 is just impossible to identify them? Uh, I haven't seen all 12 sets of remains themselves, uh, uh, but I would say that in most in all probability, most of those individuals would have been unidentifiable. There's a possibility of a third dental identification made on the basis of a, uh, uh, a three uh, root canal uh, uh, structure of a tooth. Uh, but uh, uh, so given all the material and people with uh, a lot of expertise and experience working with the material, uh, there might be a possibility of uh, uh, squeezing one or two more positive identifications out of that material, but beyond that, I don't think the, the likelihood is very high at all. And you and you and you made a comment that uh, you couldn't prove that a mistake was made, uh, and yet uh, the truth of the matter is, uh, well, I guess you can't prove that this is not a six-foot uh, individual. Isn't that true? Uh, you can't prove that a mistake was made in that regard. But what you're saying is. It's just impossible to really prove that this is a 72-inch individual as a result of that fragment. Uh, yes, sir. On the basis of this fragment, that's what was used to determine the overall height of that complete individual. On the basis of that fragment, uh, that guy could be uh, a five-foot-six big-boned individual uh, and have every characteristic of this fragment that you see right here. So there's no way at all of determining stature uh, from uh, from these tiny little long bone fragments. Uh, they virtually don't have any useful landmarks on them at all. All right, could those fragments, could this one fragment here help us determine that it was a human being as against an animal, for instance? Uh, that, that particular fragment uh, uh, is so unidentifiable that uh, anthropologists, very well qualified, board certified anthropologists, uh, work looking at that fragment have come to three different conclusions. One, that it might be part of a pubic bone from further down the ramus. Two, that it might be from the skull uh, near the foramen magnum, the large opening at the base of the skull. And three, that it's non-human. Uh, there's no consensus at all among very well qualified people, but none of them have come to the conclusion that it's part of a pubic symphysis. Well, You have complimented the people in Hawaii, the CIL people, um, and we found them to be very cooperative when we were there. We're far from experts, obviously. Uh, and nobody is, uh, I believe the chairman said this in his opening remarks, we're certainly not on a, on a witch hunt. We're not trying to, to, uh, to throw blame on anybody or anything of that nature. Uh, I, I said in my very brief opening remarks, I'm very much concerned, and I know we all are, with having closed cases in many instances where it's just impossible. I mean, just tell you, you don't have to be an expert to know it's just impossible to, be, to positively identify people. Um, you've indicated, too, that uh, the Vietnamese apparently don't have near the expertise that we have in these areas. Could they, um, let's say, the, the, the excavation site that you referred to, uh, there's 16-man 16, 16 crew, 
uh, two managed to bail out and, and were, were, were saved, right? Yes, sir. Uh, the other 14 apparently died with plane, apparently. Yes, sir. Uh, could fragments have been substituted there in spite of their lack of, of, of expertise uh, equal to ours by the Vietnamese if they wanted to to fool us in any way and things like that. Could some of these fragments have come? They could have. Is that true? They could have come from, from, from other human beings, from other animals, if you will, certainly from other instances. Uh, I realize that I, I'm, I'm, I'm being negative here. I'm, I'm picking on the most negative instances. I'm not trying to, to pick on the CIL when I say that. Uh, but is, is that true? Uh, to a point, sir, it is. Uh, the, uh some of the bone fragments were from the surface at the crash site, as were some of the uh, ID tags were found on the surface. They could have been brought in, yes. Uh, the majority of, of fragments, the, the large majority of fragments, however, came from uh, the crater and from the burial in the, uh, the uh, deposits in the crater. And uh, no, I don't think the, the likelihood is very high at all that those were planted. Now, we don't know uh, if uh, the, uh, the plane uh, didn't come down on somebody. Uh, there could have been some poor fellow walking through the, the woods one night and a plane fall on him. Uh, so you could have a, an additional body or, or more that way and without anyone planting them. I think the prob probability of that is very, very low. Uh, so all of the fragments, I think, recovered with the possible exception of some of the surface fragments uh, were uh, from the, uh, the crash. All right, well, if in 1986 we can't make a positive idea of these remains, what about remains, in your opinion, which were identified, quote, identified prior to the CIL's existence? <coughs> Comment? Well, the CIL has been in existence in one form or another for, for many, many years. Uh, Mr. Frui has been associated with the Army uh, since uh, 1951 in uh, either as a contract employee or uh, as a uh, civil servant. Uh, so it's been around for a long time. Well, have, 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 uh, it wasn't it was our expertise back then equal to what it is today? No, sir. Uh, we've made a lot of improvement in expertise and uh, uh, educational uh, improvements over the last decade. But, but it, it, was, it was generally pretty good then. All right, let me um, share with you a, a situation, factual as far as I know. Nine individuals in four caskets. Apparently no actual identification of remains. It was presumed that the fragments in these four caskets consisted or were at one time nine individuals identified as nine individuals. They were in fact identified as nine individuals. Uh, one of those nine, uh, I believe my recollection is correct, uh, happened to walk off of the airplane uh, uh, some, some years later. Uh, but if those remains were exhumed, could you possibly make some identifications? Yes, sir, possibly I'd, I'd have to see. All anthropologists uh, working in forensic work, uh, I think the, the greatest horror that we could possibly imagine is that someone will come walking in the door that we've positively identified as being dead. And uh, the, the, the things that I go through in my own mind before I come to that conclusion are uh, 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 very painstaking. I think the possibility is that, that someone could come walking in the door uh, from Seal High or from, from any other laboratory for that matter. Uh, but, and generally the work at Seal High I think is, is, is quite adequate. It, it, the resources there are, are not superb. Uh, they could be beefed up. They've got adequate personnel there in terms of numbers. Uh, they, they've just hired uh, six more people uh, to beef up that laboratory. Uh, they don't need that. I, it, with an unrestrained hand, I could go into that laboratory and reduce the, the personnel cost probably uh, appreciably and still get better results from that laboratory. The same way uh,
put some of those personnel costs into equipment, most of which is one-time purchase, and you've got a, a first-class laboratory. If you have first-class direction and a fully qualified expert running the laboratory that's not being fettered by any administrative pressures. Do you know, sir, what the DOD policy is in exhumation of group remains? I'm not sure that I, I follow. Uh, I, I do know that the uh, uh, the excavation in this particular case was made without uh, anyone in forensic anthropology training. No, I'm talking about ex exhumation. No, oh, I'm no, sorry. no, sir. I, no, I don't. You don't know. Well, I don't know how much you uh, personally were involved in terms of interest or any other involvement in this entire issue prior to having been requested to, to give us your report on, on this excavation uh, that you referred to. Um, was, your, was your knowledge or is your knowledge now broad enough to to uh, acknowledge to this committee uh, that you feel there probably are pretty good chances that an awful lot of instances of, quote, positive identification were mistaken? Generally, uh, not looking at Pac yeah. now. Uh, no, sir, I don't believe that's true at all. I believe that the, the probability is that very few misidentifications have been made in that laboratory. Uh, as I said, uh, remember, we're not dealing in this type of situation on a daily basis. The workload in that laboratory is not extraordinary. Uh, uh, two or three of us together have individually uh, workloads comparable to what goes through that laboratory. The majority of cases going through that laboratory are routine, easily identified ma uh, material. And I, I really would not like the families of of uh, people who have been identified in that laboratory to think that a lot of mistakes have been made. I don't think that's the case at all. Well, now you made a comment. I wrote it down. Uh, uh, something must be done, words to that effect, to reestablish credibility with the families. All right, why? Because Poxe itself, I think, has, has cost the laboratory a loss of cred credibility. Now, it's been said that no, no loss has taken place, but I think our presence here today uh, means that the lab has lost credibility. All right, what can be done then to establish a number of things can be done, sir. Uh, uh, number one, we need a trained, well qualified forensic anthropologist in charge of the anthropology at the laboratory, one who would be able himself or herself to come to this committee and present their views in person and not have to, to uh, uh, have others representing them. Uh, we need to reduce the number of people at that laboratory, the scientific personnel. Uh, we have too many people. They're not being allowed to, to uh, uh, engage uh, in, uh, apply their expertise uh, effectively as it is now. We need outside supervision and more than one individual, no matter how good, how uh, upright that individual is. We need more than one individual. We need different perspectives. We need anthropologists uh, going to the actual excavations unless it is in a war zone and participating in the actual excavations. More material could be identified because it would be recovered with better expertise at the scene. Uh, we need uh, better equipment at the laboratory, and we need more constant interaction between scientific personnel at the laboratory uh, and uh, uh, their colleagues on the mainland. To do that, uh, the, the few advantages of having that laboratory in Hawaii in that occasionally they have to go to Southeast Asia, that those few advantages are overshadowed by the disadvantages of its isolated location 
to the rest of the scientific community. And I don't mean to say my colleagues at the University of Hawaii are, are intellectually isolated. I don't think that's true at all. But the laboratory has uh, uh, managed to, to be considerably isolated. The scientific literature available in the library at the the laboratory is virtually non-existent. Now, this may have changed since December when we pointed out its, its sparsity. Uh, it really needs some expertise. It really needs uh, an open hand. We must not ever allow anthropologists to make dental identifications again at that laboratory. Uh, they now have a, a full-time army dentist assigned to the laboratory. He doesn't have a lot of experience, but he's bright. He's learning. And I think that that problem is something that probably is in the past now. But in the, in the past, the anthropologists did everything, dental identifications, uh, skeletal identifications, and you couldn't tell from the, uh, the reports who was doing what in terms of the final uh, conclusions. A lot needs to be done. A lot could be done. It wouldn't cost a lot of money. Uh, the end result would be better. Uh, and the first step to all of this would be openness in the laboratory and, and allowing the scientific uh, personnel in the laboratory to talk to their, their colleagues. And there have been instance, instances in the last few months when they've been told that they can't. To talk to their colleagues? Yes, sir. And that's something that needs to be done, uh, one scientist to another. Yes, sir. It's my understanding, in fact, that uh, uh, in the last uh, few days or weeks, uh, a labor relations officer has had to come in to uh, 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 intercede in the, the problems, uh, the personnel problems within the laboratory itself. Thank you, Doctor. Thank you so much for all your help. Thank you, uh, Representative Dolorakis. I am. Uh, I appreciate the depth of the, the questions. I think that uh, Dr. Maples has certainly been a major contributor to our record here, and uh, uh, the ability to, I think, reflect uh, with uh, great professionalism on uh, the significance of the identification process gives us a better understanding of uh, the difficulties uh, in the process and uh, the great uh, evaluation that you must make as you seek to make a positive identification or on the other hand reflect on the qualification that you must give and I certainly commend you we have one more panel uh, I would excuse you Dr. Maples and wish you a good day thank you very much our remaining panel will consist of Major General John S. Crosby United States Army Assistant Deputy Chief of Staff for Personnel if you'd come up to the table along with Lieutenant Colonel Johnny Webb, United States Army Commander, United States Army Central Identification Laboratory in Hawaii, and Dr. Ellis R. Curley, Forensic Anthropologist, Huntington, Maryland. For those of you who have been following uh, our efforts to serve the subpoena this morning, I've been advised that Major Mark Smith was on the passenger list uh, this morning for uh, uh, Fayetteville, North Carolina on Piedmont Airlines. He did not uh, take that flight, however, and they're still looking for his whereabouts at national airports. So uh, that's where we are on Major Smith. There's a lot of people out there today, I'm told. I also uh, would share with my colleagues the, uh, the fact that we have conferred with counsel and uh, have been advised that we do have the authority to subpoena uh, Gregson uh, Obasi, allegedly one or the other. And uh, I would intend tomorrow at our business markup to seek authorization from the uh, members of the committee to initiate uh, a subpoena uh, for uh, Gregson Obasi and bring this gentleman before. Uh, our committee at a future date. With that, uh, uh, gentlemen, I would uh, suggest that we proceed with the remaining uh, panel. I would ask that you proceed in any manner that you so desire. Uh, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee, I am Major General John S. Crosby, Assistant Deputy Chief of Staff for Personnel of the Department of the Army. I have with me today uh, Dr. Ellis 
uh, R. Cur Curley, Fellow of the American Academy of Forensic Sciences and consultant to the Army, and Lieutenant Colonel Johnny E. Webb, Jr., Commander of the U.S. Army Central Identification Laboratory in Hawaii. Also in attendance are Brigadier General Leslie E. Beavers, former Director of Personnel Plans and Systems, Office of the Deputy Chief of Staff of Personnel, back on the front row, and Dr. Uh, Robert R. McMeekin, uh, Director of the Armed Forces Institute of Pathology. I have a prepared statement which I would like to have entered into the record. Your statement and will, will be entered in the records if read. Okay, with, with your permission, Mr. Chairman, I will summarize that statement. Please proceed. Uh General. The Department of uh, the Army is keenly aware of the sensitivity involved concerning the search, recovery, and identification of unaccounted for Americans in Southeast Asia. The President has assigned the highest national priority and pledged the full resources of the government to the effort to obtain as full of po as possible an account of those Americans. The Army, through the Deputy Chief of Staff for Personnel, serves as Department of Defense executive agent for the processing and identification of remains. I am here to discuss how the Central Identification Laboratory in Hawaii supports that accounting. Currently, SILHI conducts search and recovery operations throughout Southeast Asia, Korea, and World War II Pacific areas of operation. The laboratory accumulates and catalogs information on American and allied personnel listed as missing or declared dead, but whose remains have not been recovered. It searches aircraft's crash sites and grave sites to recover remains and participates in technical level meetings with the Indo-Chinese officials. The laboratory applies anthropological, odontological, and other sophisticated techniques to establish identification of repatriated remains, as well as those recovered by excavating aircraft crash sites. In addition, it provides worldwide emergency search, recovery, and identification of remains in support of the Army's Mortuary Affairs Program and assists the Department of Navy and Air Force as required. One of these search and recovery missions, conducted jointly with the Laotian government, took place at Paksay, Laos from 10 to 22 February 1985. This marked the first time since the end of the Vietnam War in 1975 that U.S. specialists were allowed to search for the remains of Americans in Southeast Asia. The remains arrived at the Central Identification Laboratory on February the 25th 1985 for identification processing. After extensive evaluation, the laboratory re re recommended individual identification of the remains of all 13 crew members. On July the 1st, 1985, the Armed Services Grave Registration Office, so-called ASCRO, a board consisting of representatives from each of the services, which makes final identification approval, approved the identification as recommended. Following the board's action, U.S. Air Force officials offered to brief all involved families on the overall excavation process and to visit each family to explain the individual identification process. Some questions raised by a few families, the media, and anthropologists have made these cases a center of controversy. Of the 13 sets of remains, 10 have been buried. Of these 10, eight families received visits by U.S. Air Force personnel to explain the identification procedures. One of the eight families obtained a second opinion by an anthropologist which supported the Central Identification Lab's identification. The 11th set of remains was sent to a funeral home at family request, but the remains have not been buried as of this date. The 12th set of remains has not been accepted by the family and is in military custody at the U.S. Army Mortuary in uh, Oakland, California. The final set of remains was offered to the family but was become the subject of a lawsuit and an administrative claim by the next of kin against the U.S. government. Because the matter is currently in litigation, the Army cannot comment further on this case. In anticipation of an increased workload, 
And as a result of the con controversy generated by the Poxay identification, the Army, we ask the team of nationally prominent uh, uh, forensic scientists to conduct an independent review of the uh, Central Identification Lab in Hawaii. The team consisted of Ellis uh, R. Curley, Ph.D., Lowell Levine, DDS, and William R. Maples, who you just heard, a Ph.D. Doctors Curley and Maples are forensic anthropologists, and Dr. Levine is a forensic odontologist. All are board certified and fellows of and have been past officers of the American Academy of Forensic Scientists. They conducted the review from 9 to 12 December 1985. Based on the recommendations of the review team, the Army modified its review and approval process for individual case files. Before the ASCRO acts on a laboratory identification, the Armed Forces Institute of Pathology reviews the case file. Dr. Ellis R. Curley also reviews each case file and advises the chief ASCRO in those cases involving identification of human skeletal remains. We are going to add another anthropologist to the process. I discussed this this morning with Dr. Curley. Once the identification is approved, the service concerned offers to explain the identification to the family. Additionally, in those cases where the identification is questioned by the next of kin, they are provided the opportunity to obtain a private review from whatever source they desire and to have that input considered by the ASCRO. The commitment of the U.S. government to achieve the fullest possible accounting of American citizens missing in Southeast Asia is clearly fully supported by the U.S. Army. The dedicated professional personnel involved in the search, recovery, and identification mission play a vital role. The U.S. Army is very proud of the Central Identification Lab and its outstanding uh, staff and its accomplishments over these many years. I have appreciated this opportunity, Mr. Chairman, to appear before the committee and should be happy to answer any questions that you have. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, General. Uh, Lieutenant Colonel Webb? Yes, sir. Do you have a statement for the record? No, sir. No, sir. We have the only uh, statement is one I have, Mr. Chairman. All right. I would. Uh, ask for your evaluation of Dr. Maple's testimony, uh, General. You uh, sat through this morning testimony of the doctor with regard to the evaluation and uh, in view of the uh, uh, frankness of his uh, evaluation, I, I wonder if you would comment on uh, your overall uh, observation of that testimony. Yes, sir. Uh, at the outset, uh, Mr. Chairman, I'd like to say that uh, last uh, summer, on the onset of the uh, controversy on the Poxay Lau case, and the fact that we foresaw, uh, uh, foresaw an increased workload at uh, Silhai based upon uh, some possible return from Vietnam of remains, uh, we ask uh, or recommended that a team be formed of uh, eminent anthropologists and be sent to uh, Silhai to check how they do their business. Uh, when we asked Dr. Angel from the Smithsonian Institute for recommendations of personnel to be on that team, he recommended Dr. Maples, uh, Dr. Curley, and others. From that list, we selected him based upon that uh, reputation, his credentials, and his past performance. So clearly, we think Dr. Maples is an eminent anthropologist and respect his views uh, and uh, the views of his colleague, Dr. Uh, colleagues, Dr. Curley and uh, Drs. Levine. We do, however, feel that we do have some d uh, differences in opinions because of uh, operations that we know are ongoing in the Pacific area, such as the location of the Central Identification Lab. We feel because of the search operations that are conducted there, the fact that the majority of their uh, uh, business is going to be done in the Pacific Basin and in support of the uh, uh, sink pack who has some responsibilities out in that area, we decided to keep the sill high there. 
we have other central identification laboratories uh, other other places in the in the world uh, to take care of other uh, other problems yes sir. so uh, let me just say in sum that we accepted the recommendations of the board that and the team that went there we are acting in a, the, as fast as we can to implement their recommendations as a matter of fact as you members of the committee said we concur in those recommendations and we are trying to implement them as, as, as soon as possible. We did uh, discuss uh, uh, deviations, slight deviations from those recommendations with members of the team after their return, and we have taken uh, positive action to correct those deficiencies. General, my, my question is a little more specific. Uh, uh, the doctor indicated that it was uh, doubtful to, if they could make positive identification for numerous reasons associated with his presentation. Now, we've seen the, the five, allegedly five parachutes that were seen out of the aircraft. My question specifically to you is, do you take issue with that since positive identification was basically made by the Army and released? And you've heard the doctor's testimony saying that in his professional opinion, it would be almost impossible to make positive identification. So that, to me, there is a discrepancy there. And I would like you to specifically evaluate which is that, that specific differences uh, of your a, findings vis-a-vis -vis his yes, contention sir. that you couldn't make a positive identification. Yes, sir. Uh, we uh, have all the Poxley Lau cases under review, sir. That's uh, uh, those that whole procedure under review, and we have uh, uh, some specific cases under review. Are you reviewing it with the idea that you may reevaluate it yes, and sir? find? Uh, a different conclusion? Yes, sir. We are reevaluating based upon the recommendations of the team members and the chairman of the team and uh, Dr. Maples. I wonder, Dr. Curley, if you could respond to uh, this difference uh, of professional opinions. A conclusion was reached by the Army, and we've had uh, professional testimony with regard to the difficulty or impossibility of reaching positive identification. Is this review? as a consequence of this concern, or is it an ongoing review, or does your review uh, perhaps uh, contend that you will reach another conclusion other than the previous conclusion? Well, I think our re report reached a conclusion uh, to the effect that the POXA cases, many of them, the pro I'm sorry, the many of the POXA cases were not identifiable by any means known to us, that we would not be able to identify them. And I believe that the, that report is the reason for the review of the cases. Well, Colonel Webb, how was the positive identification made then? Now we seem to have an acknowledgement you couldn't make a positive identification, yet was there not a positive identification made from the standpoint of the position of the Army? <clears throat> recommendation for identification made and, and accepted and that was made a lot of it based on uh, the testimony you have heard today based on a technique uh, that was used uh, morphological approximation so uh, I guess it's fair to say that your conclusion now is that uh, this type of identification does not necessarily lend itself to a positive quote unquote uh, type of identification Mr. Murkowski, Please, uh, if I no. may interrupt, sure. there are other methods of making identification than simply the anthropological ones, and I think circumstances in many cases have... Uh, Additional factors, but right. I, I guess I'm Additional getting factors. confused a little bit on the question of positive identification and the contention from our former witness that it was almost impossible to make positive identification, and, from and the your contention, Dr. Uh, Curley, that it's very difficult, if not impossible, to have a positive identification and the realization that we've had one from this case, or several. Well, I would emphasize that I was speaking about identification from the skeletal remains, which is all that we dealt with. 
Well, you're using additional uh, information. But the Army might The not. Army would be. Well, I guess in general, uh, General, would you conclude then that this particular epoxy case, uh, since you've acknowledged that it is under review, may indeed result in a different finding after your evaluation currently? Sir, yes, sir, it may. As when we do you anticipate having a conclusion of your reevaluation? Uh, the conclusion of the uh, reevaluation has been reached. Uh, and if uh, we under a closed session, we would be glad to share those with you, sir. Uh, the, uh, I say that we are under litigation in this matter, and uh, we would share that with you in a uh, uh, closed session. Or provide it for the record. Are you continuing to still use the uh, morphologic approximant, uh, approximation process? Not as a basis for identification. But are you still, what purpose are you continuing to use it? It has not been, uh, we have had nine cases, I believe nine cases, uh, since uh, this uh, team, and we have not used the process since then, uh, sir. You as have not used it since the nine cases. Is that a consequence of the Secretary of Army's order not to use it? It is, based, uh, it is based upon the decision not to use it by the Secretary of the Army, based upon the, uh, the recommendation of the team headed by uh, Dr. Curley and uh, with uh, uh, Dr. Maples. And Yet Dr. that was, the, was used in this, in this case to reach the conclusions that the Army had previously reached. Sir, I was not there, and I'm just going to give you uh, my, uh, I will answer your question, and I'll turn to uh, Colonel Webb, because he knows better than I. But, uh, there were other, the other methods that mentioned by uh, Dr. Curley and Dr. Webb, I'm sure, were used because those are standard anthropolo uh, anthropological methods of identification and, uh, and in conjunction with uh, the uh, uh, morphological approximation. And I'll just pass the remainder if uh, Colonel Webb has anything Please to add to Colonel. what I said. Yes, sir. Dur during uh, the examination of the pox A remains, morphological approximation was used and it was used as a basis for the identifications. However, other techniques were also employed, uh, as Dr. Maples has said, in the cases where there were dental remains. Uh, the dental remains were examined using uh, comparisons of, with dental records and dental x-rays of available. So any technique available to anthropologists and odontologists was used in trying to establish identifications. Uh, the press has reported from time to time that there were certain pressures brought to bear on uh, responsible people in the laboratory to encourage them to make a, uh, an identification, uh, not necessarily positive, but with more impact. Uh, do you have any knowledge uh, that this may have actually taken place in the laboratories where there was pressure uh, brought on personnel to uh, make certain determinations with respect to recovered uh, remains? Uh, from my p point of view, sir, I've been uh, in my present job for about a year and been involved with the laboratory almost since the onset of uh, being there. Have worked with the leadership in the Army uh, all the way through uh, the supervisory staff of an agency here in Washington that uh, deals directly with uh, Colonel Webb on a weekly and sometimes daily basis. I have never heard anyone talk to me or imply to me any pressure uh, for identification. What we do uh, consider, of course, is the needs of the family and uh, the desire to return remains from Southeast Asia. And if they're identifiable, to identify them and return them to the families. Yes. And if they are not identifiable, we will classify them as such. And that has been done with regularity and we have not had, in my knowledge, any pressure. But I will add that I have heard, and I hear again I've heard, that people that work these, uh, these may generate self uh, internal pressure, but uh, so far as our pr pressure, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, we have not applied it, nor have I been uh, told of anybody that has uh, put pressure on for identification. Is there any knowledge that uh, you may have or your colleagues with regard to Thorn? Hagelson or Lieutenant Colonel Webb, who's with us, uh, making allegations or deletions to reports offered by the laboratory's forensic anthropologists? 
Sir, would you state that again? I'm Basically, sorry. any alterations or deletions to reports that have come out of the laboratory's forensic anthropologists attributed to uh, Colonel Webb or uh, Thorne Hegelson. I have not, sir. I have not heard of you that. you have any comment on that, Colonel? Yes, sir, I do. Uh, I know we've all heard these allegations, and yes, I do proofread each case before it goes out. And yes, if I find uh, errors as far as uh, misspelled words, uh, anything of that nature, then I make those corrections. However, I have never and never will make modifi modifications or changes to the report that changes that report or that the anthropologist or the odontologist who assigned that report disagree with. Tell us. Uh a little bit about the process of how differences of opinion are resolved because uh, I'm sure in your process since you have uh, so much information, so many experts involved and uh, such minute detail to address, uh, do you generally discuss uh, in some prescribed manner or procedure and then reach a consensus? Could you give us some idea of how that's uh, how that's arranged yes sir we uh, when there is a difference of opinion and naturally uh, in cases uh, there will be a difference of opinion uh, we get together as a group and discuss our differences of opinion uh, the anthropologist the odontologist uh, carrying on the discussion uh, and to this point we've been able to come to a consensus of opinion when we are not able to do that, I would say that what we would do is when we have a difference of opinion, we would send it to the outside uh, consultants that we have What's this? and let them review it and uh, give us their input. So you've not had occasions when uh, there was a, a, a dissent in the sense of not being able to reach a conclusion. You've always been able to sit down and resolve it to the satisfaction of, uh, of all so that you could reach a unanimous conclusion. Yes, sir. Have you had recommendations concerning identifications uh, being forwarded to the Armed Services Grave Registration Office Board, which were not perhaps consistent with those made by the laboratory's anthropologists in, in, the, uh, in the past? And specifically, in forwarding uh, your recommendations, have there been inconsistencies uh, on occasion with the laboratory's anthropologists or odontologists? This no. uh, has been a question raised to the committee, and you've no knowledge of this. No, sir. Tell us, uh, uh, with regard to uh, an incident where we had an aircraft go down, and I may be uh, a little loose on the pronunciation, but uh, in Laos, a place called Sa Yurli Akit, uh, or Sa Yurli Akat, or Savankat. Savankat? Yeah, that's pretty close. Yes, sir. <laughs> yes, sir. Uh, the question is, was there a mor um, morphologic, and that's close enough, too, approximation used for the process of examining and identification of remains used on that <coughs> particular incident? Sir, as we have said, uh, if it was used, it was not as a basis for identification. As Dr. Maples has said, it is commonly used by anthropologists to get a general idea of the stature of the individual. Well, was this used in that instance, though, to your knowledge? Not to my knowledge. Okay. And I, I do, sir, I do know that it was not a basis for any of the identifications I'm recommended. I'm just curious to know if it took place as a, after the notice from the Secretary of the Army not to use that procedure again, and your answer, I gather, is it did not, to your knowledge. Senator DeConcini, uh, I'm sure you Chairman, have several thank questions. thank you. Uh, first, uh, General Crosby, I want to uh, first say to you that the personnel in Hawaii at the center there, and particularly Lieutenant Colonel Webb, uh, demonstrated to us great professional uh, cooperation when we visited there, and I thank you for that. You've got dedicated people, there's no question in my mind. The question in my mind is the question of credibility now that has been raised, very technical indeed. Maybe a lot of people don't, don't really understand it, 
I certainly didn't uh, before I got into this matter. Some people don't care what difference does it make. Uh, but I think because of the sensitivityness of this particular problem, I just want the record to be very clear. My understanding now is that uh, morphologic approximation is no longer used for positive identification. Is that correct? That's correct, sir. Yes. Now, Colonel Webb, maybe you can answer. How many cases, to your knowledge, was that technique used for positive identification? Sir, that's, without going back and looking at the files, that's a question that I, I can't answer at this time. Uh, and it may have been used as one procedure where uh, many procedures were utilized, such as dental identification. But without looking at the files, I can't answer that question. Uh, is that a great burden to, to search the files to find out? Uh, no, sir, it is not. We will, would we would you supply that to us in due time? I don't want to put uh, yes, more sir. burden on you than you have. Number two, in the uh, poxy uh, crash, uh, that was used to identify positively the morphologic uh, approximation of, of all of the remains? No, sir, not all of the remains. We have... Uh, Ten... We have said, I think, and Dr. Maples has agreed, that uh, two were good dental identifications. Uh, we, we contend that there is another dental identification. So other than, than those three, uh, probably it was used in, uh, in the other 10 cases. Which would be 10 cases. Yes, sir. Are, are those the, uh, of the 10 cases that uh, General Crosby said were, were already buried, Three of those ten are the ones that were positively identified through, in your judgment, by other means, including dental yes. records. Yes. So you have seven that were uh, morphological approximation identifications. Now, is it correct that uh, the positive identification has been rescinded as to Lieutenant Colonel Hart? Uh, that's the uh, issue, sir, that I would like to talk about in closed session because it deals with the individual uh, person that's under litigation and uh, recommend that we talk to that in closed session. Well, uh, and I appreciate that. Can you, uh, can you say this, that the testimony by Dr. Maples, who stated that that had been rescinded, is that inaccurate or is it accurate? It's just his statement, not yours. Sir, I would uh, again like to ask that we say that uh, in a closed session. Um, can I ask you then, General, what is classified about uh, this particular? It's not classified, sir. Uh, the litigation that's ongoing uh, in, in is, uh, and I've been advised that the best way to provide you that information is through uh, closed session. Very good. The uh, seven cases that uh, were the morphologic approximation used as positive identification that have been buried, are those un under consideration for rescission, uh, rescinding also, rescission also? Uh, no, sir, they're not. We went back to the family's concern, explained to them the findings of the review board, explained the procedures and process, uh, gave them the opportunity to respond and provide any more information or ask uh, that we review the case. Uh, they elected not to do that, sir, and uh, that's where we stand today. Don't you find that a problem, uh, General, at least to continue to stand on what is considered now uh, unacceptable uh, forensic technique in anthropology to continue to carry those on official records as the identified positively? Isn't it some moral obligation, if nothing more, to change the records? And if nobody wants to pursue it, so be it. But uh, don't you feel some problem with that in your own mind? No, sir. I, uh, excuse me, sir. Go ahead. No, sir, I don't. Uh, when the board reviewed that, uh, same question arose in the minds of the members of the uh, review team, mm -hmm. uh, headed by uh, Dr. Curley uh, and with Dr. Maples as a member and Dr. Levine. Uh, they recommended the procedure that we use to go back to the families, explain to them uh, how, what the procedures use, what the results of those procedures, and ask what they wanted to do. We did that, and the families are comfortable with what uh, has been done. They are comfortable with the identification, 
and the way those uh, results were uh, provided to them, and uh, they do not want to raise the issue. So uh, it's, it's your position that if the families are satisfied, uh, our government should be satisfied? If the f I am of the opinion, sir, if the families are satisfied, uh, that we should allow them to uh, have their uh, say in the procedures and continue to do what is necessary to ensure that any identification that we provide to any family is the best possible that we can in, provide. In the future? Yes, sir. Because uh, it's fair to say in this case it was not the best yes, sir. possible and in as, retrospect. Yes, sir. And as doctor, I would like to add that as Dr. Maple said that this is in his view, and I'm putting him, my word to his statement, is that it is a, this is an aberration of the procedures of the lab in the past. Uh, this was an unusual case and that, uh, again, putting words, uh, my own words to his comment, that uh, the Central Identification Lab in the past, with the thousands of identifications that they've had over the years, have far and away been accurate in their identification. The Poxay Laos case and the way the accident happened, uh, the resultant excavation by the team headed by uh, Colonel Webb uh, was a uh, unique case, and in this case they found, the team members, found difference in the way that we identified those remains. I'm, I have no dispute with what uh, Dr. Maples uh, yes, said, sir. General, as to the overall. I'm, I'm, I'm concerned about the uh, Paxe, uh, a case, and uh, it seems to me that it's clear and it's better off to, to, to go on record that a mistake was made and yes, that's sir. been corrected, and we're not going to do that anymore. And uh, my only quarrel now is that uh, the fact that, that, that the judgment is made, that the families say it's okay. Uh, our government is, is obviously going to abide by their wishes, and I'm not in a position to overrule that, but I, it leaves some credibility problems. Let me ask you regarding the report made by the, by the reviewing team, uh, I think that's uh, February 1986. You indicated in your opening statement that the reviewing team recommendations all had been uh, accomplished. Is that accurate? Uh, that is uh, accurate, and I also said, sir, that we went back to the team with some negotiation, if you want to call it negotiation, or some proposals uh, in the way that we handled the identifications and the way that we use consultants, and we went back to them with that, and uh, they agreed to that. Dr. Maples indicated that one of the recommendations is that a uh, qualified anthropologist be hired to head up the uh, organization uh, C, uh, CIL HI in, uh, in Hawaii. Has that been accomplished? Uh, sir, what we did is to put a senior uh, distinguished anthropologist uh, in the chain of review. Uh, we did not hire an anthropologist, a senior anthropologist, to be on site at the uh, Central Identification Lab to be in charge of that lab. Why not? Uh, because when we went discussed it with uh, members of the team and among ourselves and uh, instituted the review process of sending the uh, findings of the Central Identification Lab through the Armed Forces Institute of Pathology to Dr. Maples and then to the ASCRO board, that that procedure would serve a very definite review process that would ensure uh, uh, scientific uh, rigidity. Uh, who is that individual that is there now? Uh, uh, there where, sir? Uh, that has been put in the review process that you said, the uh, anthropologist. Well, there are two. The anthropologist is Dr. Curley. Dr. Curley is, is the yes, one. Yes, sir. You were and not part of that before. Is that correct, Dr. Curley? That's correct. And now you are. Now, your, uh, the report here says that you concur with the uh, anthropologist uh, to be hired, uh, an additional one or two as identification specialists would increase the speed uh, with which remains could be processed in the event that many more bodies are returned or dis are recovered. Has that been accomplished? Uh, yes, sir, it has. So you have how many, two more anthropologists on site there? Uh, we have several more, sir. I'll, uh, the exact number I'll ask uh, Colonel Webb, but have several more. How many? What's the total? Sir, what we, we have hired three additional anthropologists, and when I say anthropologists, that's their 
position title anthropologist. All three have PhDs in anthropology. We have also hired three by title identification specialists. All three have degrees in physical anthropology. One has a PhD, the other a master's, and the, the third a bachelor's degree in anthropology. Does that include the uh, a photographer and sir, the photographic technicians? Photographer is uh, military, sir. Is so we have we have increased the military staff as well. And that's that been accomplished? Yes, sir. A full-time experience investigator. Sir, we do not have a full-time ex experienced investigator at this point in time. The reason for that at this, at this time, sir, and let me explain the way the process works. When we have need for additional information, whether it be uh, dental records, dental x-rays, whatever the need, then we go through the file that we have in the laboratory and examine that file to determine if, in fact, x-rays had been taken, et cetera. Then we request through the parent service, whether it be the Air Force or the Navy, that they send personnel out to try to recover those uh, x-rays or whatever the information we, we may need. So you're not going to have a full-time investigator? Sir, I have got an individual that works in the records room that maintains all the records, that that is his job, but as being as a trained investigator, he is not, sir. Well, then, uh, oh, the, he is not, you say? He is not a trained investigator. So when you need one, where do you get one? You call the Army or? Yes, sir. And uh, do, you do, do you do that often, or do you have any idea how often? No, sir, we do not, because we go through the parent service to try to get those records. Uh, General Crosby, the, going back to the uh, recommendation that a national or internationally known forensic anthropology anthropologist who would bring his or her credibility to the uh, CILHI should be appointed in a supervisor capacity. Is that judgment final that you are not going to do that, that you have decided to go the route of, uh, that you explained here? As you said there, sir, we think that we've accomplished what uh, that report said in a supervisory capacity. The supervisory capacity in, uh, in our view is Dr. Curley. Uh, Dr. Curley has made, uh, uh, and Dr. Maples have also uh, made the recommendation that we work uh, and hire an anthropologist to work with the ASCRO board. And uh, based on those recommendations, uh, we, are, we have not accomplished that and we are going to do that. Uh, Dr. Curley, uh, in your recommendation of the team here, uh, it seems a little different to me what had in mind. Is this what you had in mind as a, a national uh, forensic anthropologist who would bring his or her credibility to uh, CILHI should be appointed in a supervisory capacity? What we recommended, actually, was that someone be hired in a supervis supervisory capacity at the laboratory. Yeah, are you that person? No, I'm not. You're not. How often do you go to the laboratory? I've been there once. Do you do any supervision when you're there? Uh, I have not done any supervision, simply review. So there is, there is no uh, uh, satisfying, at least the recommendation has been made. Uh, that, is, is it fair to say the recommendation has been changed? It seems to have been changed. It's been changed and now it's, it's complied with in, in, subject to the, uh, in, in, in accordance with the change. Instead of that recommendation, the Army has gone along with the one further down, that forensic anthropologists be added to the ASGRO review board. So in, 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 instead of doing the first part of that, they did the second part, uh, but yet they said they concur, and now the review team says that in doing that second part that that's adequate. Uh, is that a fair statement? <coughs> I don't know what I would say what, that's adequate or not. Do you, do you think that they sh still should have a forensic anthropologist as a supervisor, as Dr. Maples apparently does? I believe it would be a good idea, yes. Is as there I any did. reason that you don't consider doing that, General? Uh, yes, sir. Two things. First, uh, uh, Tadao Furui, who is the senior anthropologist at the Central Identification Laboratory, uh, has a degree in anthropology and has well over 35 years of experience in the field. Uh, experience that has taken him all over the South Pacific and uh, identified thousands of remains. That experience, in our view, uh, 
is, uh, makes him an eminent authority in identification of military remains. Uh, we do not think there is another uh, anthropologist. There clearly are other anthropologists that are eminent in their field and clearly could do the job of a supervisor. We do not, however, think that there are uh, anthropologists that have that depth of experience in military recovery efforts. Uh, the knowledge of what, go, uh, what happens and uh, the, uh, the experience that he's gained in just the physical uh, identification of well, maybe 25 to 30,000 remains are in being involved in that number. So uh, we feel that uh, he is eminently qualified to be the senior uh, anthropologist at the Central Identification Lab. Uh, we have put him in charge of that lab. Uh, which is also one of the recommendations that we have an anthropologist in charge, and he is now in charge there as the uh, senior anthropologist. Uh, and Do you agree that that's, that's different than what the recommendation was? Uh, yes, sir. But one and I met I met the doctor. I was very very impressed yes, with sir. him. Uh, and uh, I, I don't what what I'd like to clarify is uh, when the army response to these things, they say concur, but that really isn't the facts. Uh, you didn't, you might have concurred, but you didn't uh, fulfill as the recommendation was made. You came up with other adjustments or, or alterations. That's just a fair statement, is it not? Yes. And for, for the reasons that you just gave. Yeah, may I clarify that? Certainly. Uh, and then we went on, however, after we reviewed that report and we concurred uh, through our initial uh, study of the report and discussion internal to the staff and viewing what we, uh, what we were going to do, uh, and took the team's report, and then we went back and discussed with the team uh, uh, members uh, that uh, solution. And it was our opinion uh, that we had concurrence that that would provide the uh, supervision, the oversight that would provide for positive in a, uh, a control, and that would provide us a good methodology of ensuring that the identifications were correct. Do you still stand by that now with the testimony by Dr. Maples and now Dr. Curley that you probably should have a imminent uh, qualified anthropologist, uh, non-civil service bound as a supervisor there? Uh, sir, in uh, our view, because of the experience and it's uh, in our experience uh, in the recovery of uh, military remains as opposed to strictly the anthropological uh, viewpoint, I say, yes, sir, I do. Uh, last question, uh, General. Um, you discussed uh, a little earlier the fact that uh, there was no pressure uh, put on you or that you know of, and so did uh, Colonel Webb. Uh, has there been pressure put on you as a result of the exposure now of these uh, identifications and the techniques used that is debatable, uh, other than these hearings perhaps, to do anything about those positive identifications that were made by morphologic uh, approximation? Uh, no, sir, there has there, not been. You don't, you don't have any other pressure except what might be derived from this uh, process? That's right, sir. And the fact that we want to make sure that whatever we do, we have the process in being that does it properly to include, make sure that uh, we do our, our uh, have our, execute our responsibilities in a proper manner. You said, uh, one last, another <coughs> question, uh, General. You said that uh, there were a number of these uh, types of operations. Uh, <coughs> around the, the world that we have. Is that classified, how many we have? Uh, no, sir, it's not. I don't know exactly how many it is, but uh, uh, do you know Colonel Webb? Webb? I think it's three or three. Five Where five. are they? Sir, let, let me clarify that a little bit. We don't have actual identification laboratories as the one that we have in Hawaii. What we do have are mortuaries throughout the Army system That's in what Europe. what I recall the briefing you gave yes, us. Yes, sir. I thought yeah. maybe there was a, a difference of opinion here. No, sir. Just, just to clarify, they... So this is the only laboratory? Yes, sir. This is the only identification laboratory that we have in the Army. Well, General, is, uh, is there some uh, dis un anything under discussion of moving that laboratory to the United States and uh, such as uh, was suggested by Dr. Maples? No, sir. 
There is not. I mean, to to the mainland. Excuse I was me. Say, no. my friend. Please don't tell. <laughs> please don't tell my my colleague from Sorry Hawaii. I heard that one. He'll be here in a minute. Go ahead. I, I felt his chair jump. Uh, <laughs> in his to 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 the mainland. You say there is none. Uh, no, sir. We uh, reviewed that recommendation and felt that it could serve its purpose uh, best where it is. And what do you think, Dr. Curley? I should think, in view of the fact that most of the remains are coming from the Far East, it would be an adequate place to keep it. You don't, you don't agree with Dr. Maples that there's more advantage of having it here on the mainland than it is in the state of Hawaii because of the availability of libraries and, and uh, experts such as yourself, that there's any advantage to that? Well, in this day and age of telephones and airplanes, I don't think that uh, the distance uh, is the major isolating factor. So those anthropologists can, can get whatever information they don't have available there through the telephone, in your judgment? Through journals, through membership in uh, scientific societies, and particularly attendance at meetings. May I comment on a couple Certainly. of things? Yes, sir. Uh, as far as I'm concerned. I do concur with the general that Tadao Furui has probably more experience in successful military identifications than any other forensic anthropologist. But he, uh, is it not fair, but he is the one that has come up with uh, morphologic approximation as a positive identification. Is he on board now, uh, uh, Colonel Webb, of not using that anymore? Yes, sir, he is. Thank you. Go ahead, Dr. Curley. Uh, you Whatever asked me you if say. it was adequate of what the Army has done as an alternate to hiring a forensic anthropologist out there over Dr. Ferrui was adequate. Yes, I believe it's adequate as long as there are two forensic anthropologists somewhere in the review process. Well, now you're changing your position. You said a minute ago that it's you thought there optimum. should still should it's be not, supervisory. It's not optimum, but it's, it's adequate. It's not optimum. Okay, that's fair enough. Yeah, okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, General. Colonel Webb, thank you. Before I call on Representative Villarakis, uh, there's just a couple of points that I want to make sure I understand for the record. And that is the, the reporting process, if you will. I believe uh, uh, Mr. Ferruli reports to Colonel Webb. Is that not correct? That's correct, sir. All right. And the relationship between uh, Mr. Ferruli and Dr. Curley is specifically what, sir? We worked together 30 years ago in Japan yeah. for a couple of years during the identification of the war dead. And you're a close friend? And I've seen him perhaps three times since then yeah. at a scientific meeting. But your relationship goes back a long ways. Is that not correct? 30 years. Best ago. man at your wedding and so forth. And yes, he was. So you've had a, a close relationship, I would assume. I don't know how close. Well, but, uh, obviously, I don't either. I have, but I, I, my he, question is one of, uh, of the, a question of objectivity and professionally, there's no question about the, uh, your ability to be totally objective in his professional capability, and you, in your testimony, stated that you, ha you believe that he has those qualifications that are necessary to carry out the responsibility. I said that his experience in identif identifying military remains is probably the most extensive of anyone in the world. I guess, again, I, the, I would uh, refer to the the question of uh, Dr. Ferui's insistence to proceed with the uh, morphologic uh, identification process. Uh, and uh, that evidently, uh, while we've had the, the reference from Colonel Webb that uh, uh, that matter has been resolved and that process, the morphologic process, is not utilized. Again, I, I, I gather that there has been, uh, at least on the part of uh, uh, Mr. Furui, uh, uh, a feeling or a recommendation that uh, perhaps we were uh, moving off that process uh, a little too early, that he has supported, in fact, that process. And uh, while you have since dictated a change in policy, uh, he seems to feel that uh, that process does have a place in identification. Is that not a it probably does fairly be. accurate interpretation? Yes, sir. I think that's a fairly accurate interpretation. Uh, and I, he is in the process of trying to actually document that and publish it and see if it can be accepted by the professional community. Uh, 
it would have been helpful to this committee had he been here. Is any reason that uh, he was unable to uh, come before our panel? No, sir. No. Uh, was it contemplated, perhaps, that uh, he be included, or was it uh, that we didn't ask, or a combination of both, or? I made a, I made the decision as to who would uh, who would ask him to come. And it was based upon what uh, I understood was going to be asked. And so I asked uh, the commander of the laboratory, which would be the normal person that we deal with, and Dr. Curley, who is the, uh, our team chief uh, of the investigative team, uh, and the other two uh, members because of their background and understanding of uh, Silhite. That you would have no objection if we asked him to come to the committee. Thank you, General. Re Representative Bill Rockus. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Dr. Curley. What's the difference between a f physical anthropo uh, anthropologist and a forensic? Uh, all forensic anthropologists are physical anthropologists, but the reverse is not true. Many physical anthropologists deal with fossil remain, uh, fossil specimens, fossil man, or with primate studies. Forensic anthropologists are those who have taken their training and experience and applied them to the public problems of identification of unknown remains. Well, all right. But what is some of that training and, that, and some of that experience uh, that uh, affords itself well towards this type of a problem? That would include a uh, study of human anatomy, of uh, osteology, the human skeleton, uh, in addition to standard physical anthropology, uh, uh, courses and also some experience, supervised experience in, uh, in cases of identification. Things that a physical anthropologist no. would not have? Not necessarily. Not necessarily? No, many don't. Meaning he what? He might, he might acquire them as a result of experience, but he yes. just has not studied them. In, uh, in other words, he uh, hasn't been educated formally in them. Is that? 30 years ago, there were no courses in forensic anthropology. Uh, most of us have picked up our experience along the way because we studied physical anthropology, anatomy, osteology, and the like. All right, so you're a forensic anthropologist. I am. Well, how uh, are you self-declared as a forensic anthropologist? I'm board certified. You're board certified. And that's the result of uh, the pro to having the proper education and, and the proper experience. Credentials, experience, and... Uh, Would Mr. F Ferui uh, qualify as a forensic anthropologist? Well, he has not at present. Yes, he is not, right. He's not. But would he qualify such? Has he made any attempts to be board certified? Do you know? No, he is not. <coughs> is, it, is it your position then, Dr. Curley, that uh, and, 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 you know, Mr. Ferrui is not here to defend himself, not that he needs to be defended, so to speak, other than possibly maybe this, this particular process. Uh, and we were all impressed with him, I think. I can, I can safely say when we were there, although who are we? We were far, certainly far from experts in that area. Uh, is a physical anthropologist adequate to do this job, particularly considering the, the sensitivity of it all, the significance of it, the, uh, the, what it means to the families, what it means to the country, uh, you know, because of this great emphasis uh, when we take into consideration, going back to General, General Crosby's statement, the President has aside the highest national priority and pledge the full resources of the government. I'm wondering if those resources include uh, a forensic anthropologist anywhere along the line or you have, to the effort to obtain. You have several forensic anthropologists or anthropologists who have their degrees, including some forensic study at least, uh, who have been hired there. Who have been out there. Who, are, who have been hired there. Who have been hired there. We have forensic anthropologists working, now working in CIO. I don't believe any of them are board certified, but they have had the training. Mm -hmm. Only Ferui has had the experience that he has. And the, there's a difference in degrees between the degree he received in Japan and the PhD, master's degrees that we award in this country that according to the rules of the American Board of Forensic Anthropology would preclude his applying. 
Who made the decision, sir, that there, in fact, was positive identification of these remains? Who, who was the bottom line decider? Was I'm it afraid I'll have to defer to Colonel Webb on that. Sir, that was, that was decision was made by Dal Farui and Marla Mahoney, who are the, the anthropologist, were the anthropologist working in the lab at that time. Physi physical anthropologist. Yes, sir. In point, in point of fact, I believe the ASGRO board also makes the official uh, That's right. We made, they made the recommendation. The ASGRO board accepted that recommendation, approved it. But they, they made the recommendation, sir. Were you part? You weren't part of that. Uh, would you have concurred with their recommendation if you had been there back in 1985? No, I would not. You would not have. No. And that is why, because you, uh, because God made us all different, and we disagree on things, or is it because you have more experience and more background, and you're a board-certified forensic anthropologist? I don't think that that would influence my decision. My decision would be that. By all methods known to me, I would be unable to identify the fragments of bone that were uh, represented in these charts. <laughs> Is anybody in the ASGRO board qualified to review, to review anthropologists' work? Not as it was constituted uh, when we were out there. All right. We mentioned that in our report. Uh -huh. All right. Uh, so some mistakes were made, I think. You would agree with that? Yes. Uh, Colonel Webb, uh, I believe uh, on the 2020 program we recently saw, uh, you indicated you uh, uh, at that time at least stood by the CIL's uh, uh, positive identification recommendations as far as, do you still stand by them? Sir, I still personally believe that we probably have ad good identifications. Can we prove it? No, we cannot. Well, now, General uh, Crosby, you referred to a reevaluation. Was that the word that you used? Is yeah. that a reevaluation insofar as as these particular remains are concerned, or is that a reevaluation of the entire the entire concept, the entire picture, the entire way of doing things? Uh, two two questions there, sir. Yeah. First, uh, we reevaluated uh, the pro uh, procedures from the uh, Paxe Lao crash uh, and the remains and the identification that was made, and as I mentioned earlier, went to the families, asked for their input to be considered by, reconsidered by the ASCRO board. Uh, we did that. What were you, excuse me, sir, uh, forgive me, I don't usually get in the habit of interrupting generals. Uh, were, you, were you, in other words, considering if the families have been available, uh, amenable to, to exhuming the remains of those that have been buried? If those families uh, ask that we have reevaluate and provided uh, us with uh, that type of information, we would have reevaluated our uh, that uh, right. decision. Well, yeah, continue with your answer then to my. Uh, uh, we, I'm concerned about your reevaluation. What do you mean by reevaluation? Uh, what I mean by reevaluation yeah. is based upon the recommendation at the board. Uh, we took that recommendation and went to the families. I mean, excuse me, the team. Uh, went to the families, asked them uh, their views based upon the input from uh, the families. We then, uh, for those who ask that we uh, provide the ASCRO board uh, the uh, remains or the results, excuse me, the results, uh, and then uh, have uh, that decision run through the new process, which included the review of the uh, SILHI by uh, the Armed Forces Institute of Pathology and uh, Dr. Curley. And based upon their recommendation, uh, we would reevaluate the identification. And that's the procedure we used. Uh, you asked me also if we would exhume. It may not be necessary to uh, exhume. It may be that if they uh, had additional evidence or additional input, that we would have taken the report 
and uh, submitted that report again through the procedure. You mean if they, who had additional evidence, additional? The families. The families. Yes, sir. And uh, we would have resubmitted uh, that report of identification through the same process that I just mentioned again, which included again Dr. Curley, and based upon their review and their recommendation, we would have passed that to the ASCRO board, and the ASCRO board would have acted on it just like they did uh, under the one case that we have completed. What would they have accomplished without having the remains uh, to take another look at? Uh, the ASCRO board uh, does not view the remains. The ASCRO board yes, right. takes the recommendation from uh, the identification lab and with that uh, input makes a recommendation on identification. Uh, what they could accomplish uh, by putting it through the uh, procedures again uh, is the fact that it would be reviewed by both the Armed Forces Institute of Pathology and uh, Dr. Curley as an eminent uh, uh, forensic anthropologist, which is a different procedure than we used the first time around, sir. Well, but Dr. Curley has already told us that it's impossible to, uh, to his way of thinking, based on his background and experience and education, to have identified uh, most of those people. That's and correct. Dr. Uh, uh, Maples told us that also. Um, Church mouth. So uh, what would we do? Take those, those files and reopen them again and, and put them in the MIA POW category again? Is that what That's that only would have been the the ultimate result of it? Only for those members, uh, family members, who ask for another review. Yeah. And if uh, that review uh, said that uh, it was not identified, then that's probably what we would do. That's what we're facing uh, uh, sometime in the future. If that happens, then that's what we're going to have to do. Well, Doctor, to make uh, a General, decision. General Crosby, uh, you said that uh, in your testimony here, your prepared testimony, the U.S. Army Central Identification Laboratory was established in Thailand in March 1973, et cetera, et cetera. Dr. Maples said to me that this was something that was in existence going back to the early 1950s. Uh, was there such a thing as a Central Identification Laboratory in existence prior to 1973? I'll have to, I'm not knowledgeable of that. I can, have answer, I can answer that question. Okay. I worked at it in Japan. Uh, in 1954 and 55. It was a Central Aten uh, Identification Called Laboratory. Cent Central Identification Did Laboratory. the same uh, sophistication, if you will, that we have today? Less than we have today. Less than we have today. Because what are we saying? That uh, 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 we there were comments made that there are Central Identification Laboratories in other parts of the country. Uh, and please, General Crosby, I'm not trying to, but basically it was determined they're really, they're, they're mortuaries. What is it? We had a physical anthropologist in those mortuaries around the country, and is that equivalent to uh, the central identification laboratories that we had in the early 50s? I'm not aware of the uh, Army setup with regard to the mortuaries, but I doubt that there are anthropologists there, not to my knowledge. Uh, those are body processing centers, I believe. The central identification laboratory, and there used to be one in each theater to process the remains of, from World War II and also from the Korean War. Well, you know, uh, and I don't want to prolong this, uh, but I think it's pretty obvious that I'm greatly concerned with, with wrong identifications having been made in the past. And uh, I know that there are, every family wants to finally put this issue to rest one way or another. Um, if they feel that, uh, uh, well, one way or another, I think we all want to put it to rest one, one way or another, you know, ultimately and certainly not too long from now. Uh, but I think we've also established that there have been mistakes made in the past. And there isn't anybody who could convince me putting the, the remains, uh, uh, bones, in four caskets and then identifying them as being nine people back in 1968 was any kind of form of positive identification. Uh, Many of those families want to put the thing to rest. Some of those families are not at all satisfied. And I think we owe as much to those who are not satisfied as we owe to those who want to put it to rest and want to just go ahead and accept it, even though there may be an element, bound to be an element of doubt in their back in their minds. And I know you all want to do this. Colonel Webb, you've got a tough job. You, uh, you've got great duty insofar as where you're stationed geographically, but you obviously have a tough job otherwise. And, 
and I've got to thank you on behalf of everybody and commend you there. But the fact of the matter is the mistakes have been made. Now, are we, are we going to say that bygones be bygones and forget about the past and say, well, there are 15 recommendations here and we're going to adopt most of them and figure that we're going to be better in the future, but forget about the past? Or are we going to take a look at some of these past cases without necessarily opening up the door completely to all of them and maybe reopen some of those files and put them back into the MIAPOW category so that if we do find future fragments, we at least can have an open file for, for matching purposes, if you will. That's, I think, my last question, but it means an awful lot to me. Uh, I don't mind telling you, and I don't know that there's going to be any kind of an answer from this panel, but I, I will not be satisfied until we get an answer to We'll that respond question. to you, sir. Go yeah. ahead, please. Yes. Please, John. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you uh, very much, Mike. I think uh, uh, you. Mr. Chairman, go ahead. I had, uh, I had a comment. Sure. I don't want the impression to be given, or too much emphasis to be given, to the idea that mistakes have been made. I wasn't referring to misidentifications. We found no evidence that these could not be the people that they were said to be. All right. But we could found no be. way. But found we no found no evidence that, that they, they positively are either, and there's a big difference That's there. Quite right. I wanted to uh, make that obvious. Yes, sir. But isn't it, in light of this statement of the president's, and in light of the way that I think we all feel, and in light of the way we know the sensitivity of it all and everything, we should not be approaching it from the standpoint they. They may be. I think we should be approaching it from the standpoint of they must be or the positive identification, if we're going to have positive identification. And by far, the majority of the Army's identifications have been positive or very, very strong identifications. What you're saying is that this is not indicative of what the, the past identifications? Absolutely. That is not indicative. It's not indicative. In the cases of the nine, the, the supposedly nine batches of bones in, buried in four caskets, you would say that's not very positive, too, back in 1968? I'm not sure what cases you're referring yeah. to, so I, I can't respond to that. I, would, uh, I know that you'll be available to help us when, if, we, if we go into those particular specific situations. Yes, I will. Thank you, Dr. Curley. Thank you, uh, Representative Delarocas. I want to thank you, gentlemen, for your, your testimony. I think uh, your, uh, you and the others uh, that make up uh, the Central Identification Laboratory are obviously knowledgeable, extremely dedicated. I think, though, that serious questions have been raised today. I think the Army has the responsibility. pathology, whether that expertise could lead anything, lead to anything additional. Uh, obviously, you are in a much better position professionally to evaluate that. But in, I think the bottom line is the burden has to be with the Army. That's where the bottom line is. And uh, I think particularly as we've examined the Parkside uh, crash site, and I've heard the evaluation of the testimony, which would lead one to the conclusion that, indeed, there is not positive identification in that case, as well as perhaps others. This is a responsibility. Uh, the issues that have been brought out uh, by the testimony here, not only if you gentlemen, but the questions raised by my colleagues, uh, I think it affects the credibility, if you will, of the process. <coughs> uh, I think that the continuance of the Central Identification Laboratory must remain intact, 
there's, I think, a legitimate concern on behalf of some of us with regard to the location of the laboratory. I have had an opportunity to view it uh, along with uh, uh, my colleagues that uh, are on the panel today, and I think uh, there is a great deal of capability. The question is uh, whether the, the Armed Forces uh, uh, Laboratory here in uh, Washington uh, and the availability of that the specific name is uh, the Armed Forces Institute of Pathology, whether that expertise could lead anything, lead to anything additional. Uh, obviously, you are in a much better position professionally to evaluate that. But in, I think the bottom line is the burden has to be with the Army. That's where the bottom line is. And uh, I think particularly as we've examined the Parkside uh, crash site, and I've heard the evaluation of the testimony, which would lead one to the conclusion that indeed there is not positive identification in that case, as well as perhaps others. This is a responsibility of the Army, and I'm sure, General Crosby, that you acknowledge that responsibility for the identification. Is that not correct? Yeah, that's correct, sir. And uh, we'll be forthright uh, proceeding with a reevaluation of the process. And again, uh, I feel that uh, uh, in bringing this matter up again for those uh, that uh, have families, uh, this indeed is a, an additional trying uh, effort, but by the same token, the necessity of reaching uh, the most positive identifications responsible is that responsibility of you gentlemen. and. Uh, I would urge that you dis you proceed with it with, with dispatch every time questions are raised. Obviously, uh, it's of great interest to those uh, who are hoping that there might be still some chance for survival, and of course, uh, that is the uh, obj object of this hearing to try and uh, bring these matters to focus so that we can reflect indeed on what we have left at the conclusion of the process. I think. Uh, as uh, we reflect on the advancement that has been made on the issue of POW MAIs, uh, the significance is, particularly in Vietnam, that we, we do have a work plan proceeding. Uh, we do have a substantial advancement in reducing the number of MIAs. I would still reflect on the percentage in comparison with the Second World War and the Vietnam, or excuse me, the Korean War, each of which were 19 to 20 percent unidentified compared with the Vietnam War, where we're working with a figure of between 5 and 6 percent. So I think that indicates that, indeed, a great deal of, of, of commitment, energy, uh, money has been expended by this administration to try and uh, reduce this problem to uh, focus in on a very uh, real reality of what remains, and uh, we are still making progress on that area. Uh, at the con as a conclusion, uh, I want to uh, advise that in the release of various communications today, this was done so as a consequence of uh, the intention of the chair to release these letters after Major Smith's testimony, but since Major Smith was not in attendance, it was felt appropriate that the letters be released, and again, we have uh, the letter from myself to Representative Hendon concerning uh, Mr. Gregson or Obasi's identity and uh, substantiating evidence of a release of the, uh, the true name of uh, Obasi Gregson in a periodical sometime in April, and also a letter from myself as chairman inviting uh, various members of the House and other interested parties to participate as uh, uh, witnesses in, during the hearing process. We also have released a letter from the uh, attorney for uh, Smith and McIntyre, and uh, this letter refers to uh, specifics of uh, consideration for the film and some 4.2 million, which uh, was the amount of money suggested that would be uh, passed once the alleged film uh, was uh, seen 
and satisfactory evidence of life sightings uh, was transmitted to others uh, and that certain individuals view the film and uh, that the monies be carried uh, and released only after they were satisfied that indeed the film uh, was reasonable evidence that uh, there were uh, MIA POWs uh, being held. Well, obviously that is still the intent of uh, the hearing is to try and uh, address this alleged film. That's what we had hoped to do in receiving testimony from Smith today, but I think it's uh, fair to say that some of us are beginning to question the uh, reliability of uh, this information. We indeed hope that there is such information, but uh, we have not seen the information. I might uh, indicate again that we will proceed with a subpoena process of both uh, Smith and McIntyre. We will also include Mr. Robert Gratson or uh, even though he is a, a citizen of uh, the British Empire and has spent a good deal of time in Bangkok, uh, the information I have is that his involvement has been in international drug and gold dealings. Allegedly, he has been accused and convicted in Bangkok of planting drugs on American tourists and then of accepting alleged kickbacks from officials to avoid prosecution of the Americans. I don't quite know what that adds up to. Uh, he allegedly has a strong dislike for the American government because he believes the American government is harassing him. I'm told that his arrest in Singapore several months ago was on charges of fraud. I'm told that he is currently in the United States, uh, uh, that uh, he has legal representation, that uh, he was acquitted of one charge in his incarceration in Singapore. Today he's reported to be in North Carolina. I'm further told that he has refused to cooperate with uh, Major Smith to provide any information to this committee, which is, of course, contrary to the information we had previously. He allegedly is uh, taking this action because he believes that he has been mistreated by the U.S. media. So with that profound observation, why I will conclude the hearing with uh, a further hearing to be scheduled when the subpoenas are served and a date is set. At that time, we would again hope to have Smith and McIntyre present to pursue the allegations that have been presented before the committee. We would also entertain a hearing to address the remaining inconsistencies charges and countercharges by bringing uh, the various witnesses together. And it would be my hope at a later date to uh, draw some conclusions uh, from uh, the process that we have gone through. And that would be, of course, with the uh, concurrence of my, my colleagues to indeed address the question of whether it's appropriate that conclusions be drawn. But I think uh, we might compare the process to the pulling together of the purse strings, and we are, we are getting down to the point where, while we still offer an open forum, we have no current witnesses uh, that have had or indicated to us that they have firsthand information. So we're still pursuing the information on the basis of those witnesses who claim to have uh, evidence, and uh, that pretty much rests with uh, McIntyre, Smith, and Obasi, Grayson, which are the same. Do you have anything to add? To no, Mr. Chairman. I, uh, I was very, I know we all were very interested in the testimony of Sergeant Dennis, was it, uh, who now lives in North Carolina, and, and I think we all had hope we would have an opportunity to get to talk to him again. I'm sure you would be considering that. Thank you. Thank you. We would conclude our fifth hearing and uh, wish you a good day. The record will be main open, remain open for a period of 10 days. Thank you, gentlemen. Good day.
They're motivated by a legitimate concern, and I understand and appreciate that. But this guy, you, know, you know, we're not trying to keep everybody out. It's just the idea that you can have a field in this area and have everybody on this side. I just think we're really on to something. Oh, I think we're proceeding legitimately in the process.